Um, is there anything that we would like to discuss during committee of the whole? Um, Acting Mayor Fode, do we have any suspension requests this evening? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Yes, we'd like to suspend Ordinance 21-43. Um, the, uh, the reason for this, this authorizes the mayor to enter into an LPA agreement with ODOT for the Ellis Street Bridge project. Uh, the, the agreement will finalize the city of Tiffin's securement of $2 million in federal funding uh, for this project through the o ODOT Administrative Municipal Bridge Fund. And we need to, we need to uh, approve this so that when the mayor gets back, he can sign that and we can keep that that funding process moving ahead. Very good. Um, who signed that one? I did. Councilman Leopard. Councilman Leopard. Would you mind handling that request? Sure will. Wonderful. Thank you. Anything else we'd like to discuss? Uh, Law Director Howard. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, resolution 21-9 is a one reading resolution, in my opinion. Um, it's more ceremonial and less uh, of substantive function. Um, and what I mean by that is that uh, you are expressing support for um, the Homelessness Council and the Transformation Life Center, but you're not providing any real specific tangible items at this point. You're not appropriating funds. You're not uh, providing any services, not entering into any sort of agreement, nothing that uh, of true substance at this point. And I think that's the purpose of the resolution though, is to, to state a general support. So that is in my opinion, one reading. So you just read it tonight by title um, or you could read the whole thing if you wanted to, but it's um, you vote on it this evening. Very good. Uh, I did not prepare the full committee report, um, and I know we were lucky enough to have Councilman Leopard, uh, Councilman Perkins, Councilwoman Yana Tuno, uh, Councilman Jones joined us, I believe, via phone, and Councilwoman Boyle. Uh, we got to speak with um, Tim from the uh, Transformational Life Center, as well as uh, Michelle Tuitt, and we discussed um, the city's role in really just promoting and, and doing what we can in the future uh, to make their program a, a successful one. Um, we will have a, a full uh, report at our next meeting, but as the law director said, it, it's basically just expressing strong support for the project. And if I could add to that, um, um, if it's possible that you can feel a virtual hug, I think Michelle Tuitt was successful. Um, she um, has got a lot of enthusiasm, enthusiasm and excitement and um, you, you can feel that uh, support that she has for the community and for this particular mission, just in the way she expressed it, even virtually. But I've worked with uh, Mrs. Tuitt for a number of years at Tiffin City Schools. She's been my son's pre-K principal at, um, at Lincoln. And she is like that all the time. It, it's actually pretty amazing to watch uh, just the uh, sheer love she has for what she does. It's, it's really quite astounding to see. Any other business we wish to discuss during Committee of the Whole? Um, Councilman Jones. Thank you, President Gilly. I just, more of an educational thing. We did talk at the Committee of the Whole special meeting about overriding the city administrators and hopefully we don't need to use this, but I think the law director spoke about 305.08 or 305.02. I got my thousand pages and flipped through that, and I cannot find anything related to that information. So could someone clarify that just for educational purposes on my end, I guess. And it doesn't have to be tonight. I mean, it's just, but I was just 
Looking around at 305, couldn't find anything. Law director. Yeah, I can explain. Um, uh, chapter uh, 30, 305 deals with traffic control for the city. And if you read through, um, there's 0 0.01 section through 0 0.09. And, and much of that section deals with granting authority to the city administrator uh, regarding traffic control in the city. Um, in particular, the, uh, the um, city administrator can um, um, place uh, traffic control devices and locate them throughout the, the city and install them. Um, so there's a clear delegation of authority from city council to do the typical um, traffic control uh, device placement around the city as uh, needed. And um, however, though it does say in 305.08, and I don't, maybe it's the, it's the last page. You got to turn to page 26 in my, um, um, in my book. Um, and that's within that particular uh, section, the traffic code. And it says though, notwithstanding any provision of this chapter, council may override any decision of the city administrator and may assume any of the powers delegated to the administrator by the legislation. And they just do that by a vote of the majority um, of members of council. So that's the, the uh, override, but that's probably the exception. You know, the general rule is you let the city administrator perform those delegated functions. Now, the other thing though, that I think I should note is, and I noted this at the committee of the whole meeting, if you look at 305.03, .03, it says all traffic control devices placed pursuant to this provision of the traffic city traffic code shall conform to the Ohio Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices for Streets and Highways as set forth in a revised code section. So you as uh, council, you've, uh, your predecessors have passed a, a section of the local code saying that you will provide, pro, you will um, follow the, um, the uh, Ohio Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. So that's the standard that you are telling the city administrator to follow when he or she makes decisions. And so I would think consistent with that, any um, overriding of the delegated authority should also comply with that manual. Any questions? No, no, th thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I wasn't looking at 3305, but I'll, I'll do that in the future, thank you. City Administrator Thornton. I guess I would ask the law director, in this case, we didn't really take action. We recommended action uh, to the council so they would not be uh, overriding an action that has already been taken. Does that make any difference, Brent? You're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, I think that um, um, the other part of the phrase though in 305.08, it says that they may, council may assume any of the powers delegated to the administrator. And I, that's really in a sense what you're doing by passage of any ordinance involves traffic control devices. You're assuming the power that you had delegated. Um, and so this was kind of an exception. Um, you're asking council because you funded a traffic study, you um, supported that effort to um, make sure that your decisions were based on some factual information, not just on a feeling or belief. And so now you received the report and you received the recommendation of the administration and legislation for you to, um, to approve. I wonder if we should also bring Matt Watson in tonight when we get to that part of the discussion so that if there are questions for him, he would be available uh, to the council members. It's council's choice. He is out there as an attendee, so we can bring him in at any time. I, for one, think that would be incredibly beneficial. I agree. Would you like us to bring him in now just so we don't avoid uh, 
you know, yeah, I would say uh, just bring that in now and just letting be in here until need be. Mr. Dutro, would that be all right or or Dale? Nick has the controls right now, so. I believe he's trying to solve another issue he has in the background that you're not aware of. He's having trouble getting Facebook Live to come up. So he may be chasing that. Nick, are you on now? I, I am, I apologize. You had asked for Matt Watson to be, to join. Yes, please. He should be joining shortly. I'm hoping he isn't in his uh, pajamas. Still in the polo. Well, thank you, City Engineer Watson, for joining us this evening. Greatly appreciated. My pleasure. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Mr. President. I just want to quickly bring up um, in your packet tonight, you saw a letter from the uh, from the mayor. Uh, um, Jason Windsor is going to chief is going to be making a um, giving giving us an update this evening and part of uh, part of his update is going to request. Uh, uh, you'll see that if you read through it, um, what he's requesting is uh, they research they recycle these uh, cruisers. Uh, after they get so many miles on them every, what is it, three to five years, Dale? Someplace. Usually around five years or 100,000 miles, somewhere in that neighborhood, 75 to 100,000. And uh, we've, got, we've got two cruisers that they're ready to uh, recycle, but what they'd like to do is uh, give them to the uh, Seneca County Sheriff. Uh, Fred Stevens inherited a mess as far as the equipment's concerned. Uh, they've got vehicles out there with over, in excess of 200,000 miles. Uh, the, the, the sheriff also uh, provides a lot of backup for, uh, for our law enforcement. So anyway, uh, that's going to be read tonight. I want you to think about it. Um, obviously, uh, the president will sign it to a committee. And uh, the hope would be that we'd have uh, an ordinance at our next meeting that we could consider to keep that moving ahead. So thank you. Thank you, Rich. Is there anything else very briefly? We are now at 658. Seeing no hands raised, we'll go ahead and call the Committee of the Whole meeting closed at 658. And we will commence with our regular scheduling meeting shortly. All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our regularly scheduled meeting of Tibbon City Council for May 17th, 2021. Wonderful to see you all today. Our invocation and Pledge of Allegiance will be led by Councilman Perry. Thank you, Mr. President. If you guys will all join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and 
and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory of God forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Councilman Perry. Uh, Council Clerk Forrest, could you do our roll call, please? Yes, Mr. President. Councilman Perry. Present. Councilwoman Boyle. Here. Councilman Gillig? Here. Councilwoman Yanatuno? Here. Councilman Jones? Present. Councilman Leopard? Here. And Councilman Perkins? Here. Let the record show that all seven council members are present this evening. Did everyone have an opportunity to review the minutes in our packet from the May 3rd regular and committee of the whole meetings and our May 10th special committee of the whole meeting? Councilman Jones. Thank you, President Gillick. Very, very minor, and I probably shouldn't even bring it up, but at the bottom of page 3636 on the Committee of the Whole, I think it was referenced that I said some of the people here in the second ward were concerned about 17 seconds to get across Sandusky Street. And I couldn't go back and review my comments, but I think I was talking about six seconds to cross Sandusky Street at 17 miles an hour. So maybe it's no big deal, but I guess I was thinking more of a six second when I was trying to uh, make a point versus 17 seconds. So don't know. Councilman, that, uh, Councilman Jones, if you could please send me the note on that, I'd appreciate it. Make sure I, I have it correctly. Thank you. I can do that. Thank you, Miss. Thank you, Councilman Jones. Any other additions, deletions, or corrections? for either set of minutes. Seeing none, they will stand approved. We'll move on to committee reports. Uh, finance committee, I did want to inform the public that's just joining us. Uh, there was a finance committee held last Wednesday. A full report will be prepared at our next meeting. And from that meeting, we discussed resolution 21-9 which is a resolution by this body expressing strong support for the Transformational Life Center established by the Seneca County Council on Homelessness. It is uh, simply a demonstration of our support for their wonderful mission. And we will read that resolution a bit later this evening. Law and Community Planning, Councilwoman Boyle. No report, Mr. President. Thank you. Materials and equipment, Councilman Jones. No report at this time, Mr. President. Thank you. Personnel and labor relations, Councilman Perry. No report, Mr. President. Thank you. Street sidewalks and sewers, Councilman Leopard. Thank you, Mr. President. Street sidewalk and sewer committee meeting was held Thursday, May 6, 2021 by a Zoom. Attending were committee members Steve Leppard, Don Yanantuno, Ken Jones, and Zach Perkins, Mayor Mott, City Administrator Dale Thornton, Law Director Ren Howard, City Council President Rich Pope, and Public Works Superintendent, Superintendent Brandon Burner. Leppard called the meeting to order at 1 o'clock p.m. and announced that the purpose of the meeting was to discuss several collapsed sewers, funding for repairs, and liquor permit renewals. Superintendent Brunner informed the committee that recently there have been two major issues with sewers in the city. The first being a collapse of 40 foot of sewer on Ann Street. This collapse was discovered March 3rd, 2021, while videoing the sewer in preparation of 2023 street paving. The sewer is a concrete sewer. Concrete sewers continue to pose problems and concerns for the city. Superintendent Berner reported that the Ann Street sewer was repaired by employees of the public works and sewer departments, and to date the cost of repair is $73,268, plus an undetermined amount for restoration. The repairs were paid from the maintenance of sewer and sewer maintenance other funds. Superintendent Berner asked that the funds 
spent be replaced back into those accounts so that he may survive the remainder of the year. Account 5448 monies were used for aggregate trucking and restoration, while the 5449 account is used for fittings, structures, and contract work. Superintendent Burner added that monies have been spent earlier in the year from those accounts for CSO 14 near the Bradley Building and Kiwanis parking lot for a broken and blocked line 35 foot long. Replacement has been completed and awaiting restoration. Contracted work on CSO 14 was $12,000. The Brighton Road collapse was discovered, discovered April 29, 2021, and is currently under repair with contractor support. Super, Superintendent Burner reported that he contacted multiple contractors qualified to perform the necessary work and questioned them as to their availability. The contractor was selected with a quote of $25,192. Mayor Moss urged the committee to move forward quickly with proper, proper appropriations to the budgets as we are facing an aging structure and repairs are necessary. He thanked the committee for the timely response to the issue and stated that in many years the department does not spend the monies budgeted. Superintendent Burner added that we still have significant issues with Ann Street and has a contractor estimate of $27,000 to replace sewer line from where the city recently stopped on Ann to Hancock Street. The plan is to replace that section in 2022. Superintendent Burner reported that on March 5th, 2021, two check valves have failed at the combined sewer over overflow number 17 at Liberty Street and are awaiting funds as no work has been performed to date. With failure of the valves, valves, we are letting water into the system at a rate of 1 million gallons per day when the river is high. This is a $23,700 repair of valves that are 70 and 30 plus years of age. Superintendent Burner is asking that additional funds be placed in Counts 5448 and 5449, so the CSO repairs can be made this year. Councilwoman Yanatuno asked that if sewer funds were available for proactive repairs or replacements, Councilman Perkins stated you'd like to see us get ahead of the curve of repairs if we are in a financial situation. Mayor Mott said that dollars are available for ongoing maintenance and issues. Sewer fund monies were built into the system for issue for issues just like this. City Administrator Thornton reported that Superintendent Burner is being very proactive with this plan that inspects the sewers well in advance of paving. This procedure is saving the city money but by not making repairs after paving. City, Administ city Administrator Thornton reported that there will be a point in time that we will have to bond money for large projects like the Riverview Estates replacement that may require $5 million over a five year period. Law Director Howard asked Superintendent Burner if he could be more specific on requested funds, line items, and accounts and provide that information to the Finance Director so that an ordinance can be prepared. Councilwoman Yanatuno introduced a motion to authorize the law director to prepare legislation to return monies to the 5448 and 5449 accounts that have already been spent on sewer issues so that there, there will be dollars available for ongoing emergencies for sewer repairs for the remainder of the year. The motion was seconded and approved by a vote of four to zero. Leopard reported that the city received from the Division of Liquor Control the annual notice to object to any permit holder for a renewal application. Leopard reported that he electronically contacted interim chief Jason Windsor and he had no concerns with any permit holder. The police department did receive a complaint this year that one permit holder was selling to an underage person. Chief Windsor reported that the department investigated and an undercover attempted to purchase alcohol without an ID and was denied. No action by the city is necessary. With no further business, the committee adjourned at 1.28 p.m.
Does anyone have any questions for Councilman Lepper? Wonderful, Fant fantastic report, Steve. Yeah. Well done. Well, uh, let's move on to economic development and downtown planning. Councilwoman Iana Tuno. No report, Mr. President. Thank you. Does anyone see a need for a committee of the whole meeting? Councilman, excuse me, uh, Acting Mayor Fote. Um, I think we got, we forgot uh, Councilman Perkins report, if he had one. My apologies. Uh, Councilman, at this time. <laughs> 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 All right, well, we crossed the T's and dotted the I's or dotted the lowercase J's, whatever the case may be. Um, I'll go ahead and repeat that. Does anyone see a need for a committee of the whole meeting at this time or at a future time? Very good. We will move on to reports of the officers. Donner, Acting Mayor Rich Fote. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll try to make this brief. Um, the, uh, the, first, the first item is the mayor's proclamation. Whereas local historic preservation is an effective tool for revitalizing neighborhoods, fostering local pride and maintaining community character while enhancing livability. And whereas historic preservation is relevant for communities across the nation, both urban and rural, rural and for Americans of all ages, all walks of life and all ethnic backgrounds. And whereas it is important to celebrate the role of history in our lives and the, and the contributions made by dedicated individuals in helping to preserve the tangible aspects of the heritage that has shaped us as a people. And now therefore I, Aaron D. Montz, Mayor of the City of Tiffin, Ohio, do hereby proclaim May 2021 as National Historic Preservation Month and call upon the people of Tiffin to join their fellow citizens across the United States in recognizing and participation as special observation done under my hand the 17th day of may in the year of our lord 2021 aaron demont's mayor um i'd like to give uh, just a brief uh financial update uh our finances are are, are moving along very well um for the uh, year we're up a uh, little over 13 percent and um uh, that's a good thing. Unemployment is also uh, is down. Uh, collections are up and unemployment's down. It's 4.4%, uh, 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 down from 5% in February. I'd like to congratulate uh, Tiffin Mercy Hospital for ranking first in the nation for rural hospitals. That's a great accomplishment and uh, something we should all be not only proud of, but very, very thankful for in our, our community. Uh, I'd also like to congratulate the uh, Varsity Club owners, Bronson and Ashley Owens, on the grand opening and ribbon uh, cutting that they held last week. Um, <clears throat> I'd also like to congratulate uh, Legacy Federal Credit Union on their uh, proposed expansion of over $1 million that's being invested back into their business in our community. We're grateful for that. Uh, congratulations to the Willows of Tiffin on ranking first in the company for customer satisfaction out of more than 130 competitors. It's good to be first, right, Dale? <laughs> in some part. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd like to remind the public about uh, bulk pickup week, week, which is going to be May 24th through the 28th. And the pickup day will be the same day as your normal trash pickup. I'd like to uh, thank the uh, Farmers Market Committee for a very successful uh, first farmers market of 2021 this past Saturday. Had great weather and uh, had a lot of participation. I'd like to remind the council and the public about uh, City Hall which is going to reopen uh, June 1st. Um, <clears throat> council and various boards and commissions will be back to meeting in person and we will be observing CDC guidelines that are still uh, in effect as, uh, as necessary. Does anyone have any questions about any of that? Councilwoman Yanatuno. I just wanted to ask on the bulk pickup 
it's still five items, just to clarify for people listening. Yeah, um, Dale, could you respond to that and also the weight and all, anything else? I discussed that with Rumkey today, that it is five items. Uh, they have been very helpful in taking what they can, as long as people don't put five, seven couches out on the street. You know, if it's five small or six small boxes, they've been very good about just taking it and going. But we just ask that uh, our citizens be reasonable in what they put out there. Many put seven items out knowing somebody's going to come along and take two of them anyhow. <laughs> so Rumkey is very good at working with us on that. It also said 18 hours before, but you know how there's a bunch of people that like to drive around picking up stuff. Does the 18 hours give enough time for a lot of that excess stuff to be picked up? Can it be out just a little sooner than that? Or are we, or are we gonna stick to the 18 hours? We're not going to police it. So if somebody puts okay. it out 20 hours before, we won't okay. be policing Just wanna it. make sure, cause we have scavengers going through the whole time. So, okay. We just ask people again, be reasonable, not put it out three days before. Councilman Jones. Thank you, President Fote. Did I understand you to say, and I know we're talking about meeting June the 2nd, face-to-face -face at City Hall. Did I understand you to say we have to follow CDC guidelines? Would that be wearing a mask? And if that is wearing a mask, why don't we do one more Zoom? We don't Maybe. have to wear. Well, first Sir? of all, we, it's gonna be June, is, uh, our next meeting will be June the 7th, the 7th. Uh, that okay. we'll be meeting. and. Uh, the the governor just dropped the uh, the mask mandate indoors, so or that'll be dropped June second, I believe, right? Okay, Law director. Maybe that's where I got second from. Okay, but I'm still not clear. When you said we have to follow the CDC guidelines, that meant after June second, no mask. Is that's that what correct. you're saying? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Councilman Perkins, did you have a question or comment? No, I'm good. Never mind. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? All right. Well, thanks. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask, um, hopefully, uh, the uh, acting police chief, Jason Winder Windsor's out there somewhere, and uh, he would like to give us um, uh, annual report to, to council. While we're waiting for active Chief Windsor, just have a quick announcement. Uh, the Facebook live stream, unfortunately, is not cooperative tonight. There will be a link posted to the recording uh, tomorrow on all social media pages. Um, Nick, did I misspeak? Will you post that after the meeting or tomorrow? I can post that as soon as the meeting ends. So I'll have that. I'll have that on YouTube, and I will go ahead and put that link on the uh, Facebook page as well. Outstanding. Thank you, Nick. Uh, welcome to Interim Chief Windsor, and he's going to give us his uh, presentation. Chief, do you need anyone else on the on the call? Uh, no, I, I don't believe so. I Thank just want to make sure. Um, does everything look like it's working correctly? Is the screen sharing correctly? Can you tell me? You can see the screen. Yes. Yeah, it looks good. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to give you a warning first off. I do talk fast. I apologize for that. It's just a habit of mine. But uh, I'm going to kind of go over our annual report. Uh, just give you a, for the new council members that may not know, just go over a little history of the police department quickly. Um, you know, we started uh, in 1821 with our first recorded marshal along with two deputies. Uh, then in 1851 to 1907, we've had 21 different, serve, uh, 21 different individuals serve as the uh, marshal police. Uh, 1908 to 2020, it changed to be the chief of police. And since then we've had 10, 10 chiefs serve as the chief of police of the city of Tiffin. Uh, in 1851, uh, we recorded uh, our first elected marshal comparable against the East police chief and the uh, first tip of the police department was formed. Uh, in 1915, we purchased our first patrol vehicle. Uh, I don't ask me what that was. I have no idea. And I can guarantee you it's nothing like what we have now. <laughs> um, total uh, manpower of the police department at that time was 12 people. Uh, uh, 
$75 a month and uh, 90 bucks for the chief, not, not a ton of money. Uh, in 1938, the Tiffin, city of Tiffin built a new uh, municipal building. And in 1940, the police department was able to move into its new location. Uh, in the 1950s, the Tiffin Police Department started its own police school, which was now referred to today as like the police academy. And uh, all required, uh, patrolmen were do, required to do 16 weeks of training. And actually, Tiffin was the first uh, department of its size, a smaller media department, to have its own police academy in the state. Uh, in 1957, they added the rank of sergeant to the police department uh, for supervisors to be supervisors over the patrolmen. Um, we had grown about 26 officers back then with three police cars and two motorcycles. And uh, we have one chief, two captains, and three sergeants and 20 patrolmen. In 1969, they created the criminal division, which is uh, still in operation today. We have uh, four people assigned to that to investigate major cases. Um, and it was the uh, first year they established the rank of lieutenant. Uh, in 1974, they had, had a major building renovation at City Hall. In 1991, we created the, uh, our, the Tim Police Department Special Response Team, uh, which is uh, still in formation today. We, they're still active and trained frequently, and actually we use them on several missions a year. It was also the first year of our first canine unit. Uh, which was led by Sergeant Mark Marquis, or I'm sorry, Mike Marquis at the time, and K9 Cora. In '99, uh, uh, we underwent a major remodel here at the police department. We used to have an old jail in the back that uh, would house our prisoners. Um, we stopped using that though several years before that, and all of our prisoners would go out to the county jail for long term housing. We uh, currently still have two holding cells here, but they're only temporary. We can only hold people for about six hours in those, in those two cells. Oops, I'm sorry, I skipped the page. Obviously, I just want to you know, cover our mission. You know, the tip of police is committed to providing a safe community by controlling crime through prevention, education, and enforcement of the law. Uh, unfortunately, this last year with the pandemic, we were not allowed to do a lot of our uh, community-based programs for education or anything. I know there's a couple of council members now that have been through our Citizens Academy. Um, unfortunately, we were, not able to, we were not able to do those last year, and uh, we're hoping now with the with the governor uh, lifting his orders and the city opening the building back up, we can restart those here sometime this year. And then our, our, va our core values, uh, the acronym FIRST, Fairness, Integrity, Respect, Service, and Teamwork. Uh, our, all of our officers try to make sure they, they adhere to those every day when they come to duty. Uh, currently, we have 37 employees at the Tiffin Police. Uh, three lieutenants, uh, each lieutenant is in charge of a division, one being the criminal division, one being the patrol division and the other being the administrative division, which oversees the all the uh, clerks, executive assistants, and the dispatchers. Um, right now, we got five employees that have been here for over 25 years serving at the Tiffin Police Department. Uh, nine of them have been here for 15 years, and the average uh, years of service is 11 and a half years on the PD. Um, our dispatchers do a great job. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we celebrated the, we, we recognized the dispatcher week. Um, these, uh, right now I say ladies, because that's all we have right now is uh, ladies serving in that position. Uh, they actually all do a fantastic job. They all have uh, received a lot of training in, uh, in emergency dispatching. They answer, last year alone, they answered 4,351 911 calls. Um, outside of that, they had 18,916 phone calls. If you've, uh, if you've never had a chance to come into the dispatch center on a, on a really busy day, you'd see uh, how stressful that job can get when they got 911 calls. They're on the phone with the, with a the victim or something, then more 911 calls are coming in. If there's only one person in there, sometimes they got to let those calls roll over to the sheriff's department because they just can't field all the calls at one time during a, during a major incident. Um, they, uh, we've got a good, like I said, good crew right now. We got, they've got a four years of experience combined. Um, we do dispatch for the tip and police and the tip and fire and rescue. So not only, not only are they answering the phone calls that are coming in, and again, when they can get pretty hectic, they're also having to monitor all the radio traffic from the police officers and the fire department, and they have to log all those communications so we keep an accurate record of, what's, of what was said. Um, they go through a lot of advanced training uh, for that job um, for uh, the police and fire dispatch. It's, it's a pretty stressful job, and we really appreciate the work they do. Come over, just a couple of our highlights from last year. 
Uh, I'm sure everybody knows, and it's probably, uh, they saw our new Ford F-150 trucks last year that we got. Uh, these actually have been uh, proven to be pretty uh, pretty handy for us, especially this last snow we had where the uh, even our Ford Explorers or the Ford Interceptors that are four-wheel drive still had a hard time because of the depth of the snow. They were getting high centered in some of the alleys and stuff. We had to go down. These trucks really uh, were really useful then. They're also useful when uh, we have large items that we can't transport as far as evidence goes or uh, found property. We used to have to rely on uh, the Public Works Department to pick up all the bicycles that people would call in as abandoned. Um, that took time out of their day to have to go get those. We now have the ability to just use a truck to throw them in there uh, and transport them out to the uh, to our to our storage location. Another thing, a pretty pretty big deal last year during the pandemic when the uh, state allowed uh, or the city allowed people to take furloughs. We had over 15 employees. We had 15 employees volunteer to take voluntary furloughs last year, totaling about 2,215 hours. So from May to July, um, we had 15 people take furloughs, which actually saved the city uh, almost $72,000 in wages. Um, so they did that uh, to help with the uh, the budget and everything, and because uh, we nobody knew what was going to be going on with the with the finances. Um, don't want to bore you with a lot of statistics. You know, obviously, if you look at the years uh, or the monthly calls for service, we, we've dropped. Um, th this is actually about the year, so it breaks it down by the year. If you want to see that, I can get you a copy of it. But our total calls for service for the years, our citations, our verbal warnings all, all dropped down a lot last year. We saw, I think, with the pandemic, a lot of people were staying home. Um, on top of that, not knowing the severity of this when it started, officers were asked to minimize contact with citizens if, as much as possible. We didn't take as much enforcement action uh, to try to uh, keep everybody healthy and safe and, and at work. Um, again, again, just some, just some statistics, you know, of our, uh, our parking, uh, our parking citations versus warnings. Uh, I think you can see this with all of our, whether it be parking or traffic, we do issue more warnings and we do citations, but we we do issue the citations on uh, when we get complaints of specific areas, uh, specific streets, or wherever uh, having a lot of problem. We try to focus on that. Uh, are we again our special response team and our crisis negotiation team? Uh, these are con these two teams are conduct or consist of uh, highly trained officers. They go through a lot more advanced training. Um, a lot of people refer to SRT as SWAT, but we refer to it as a special response team. Um, last year, again, they, their training was reduced. We, uh, we always try to have them train twice a month. Um, and they'd actually train with other departments like Fremont and Paul and their teams. But uh, again, due to the pandemic last year, we had to reduce contact with other agencies to try to keep everyone, you know, at work. Uh, last year, they actually uh, deployed on six operations. Again, the special response team and the crisis negotiation team go out on, on, uh, on very dangerous uh, operations. Uh, the first one they went out on was in January of 2020. It was actually a barricaded suicidal subject uh, armed with a gun. He was holed up in a garage. Uh, the crisis negotiation team uh, tried to negotiate with him for several hours and uh, that wasn't making any progress. So eventually we had to deploy chemical munitions uh, and that subject eventually did come out and surrender uh, peacefully. Nobody was nobody was injured. There were about there was what one, two, three, four high risk drug search warrants. Um, again, uh, SRT responds on these when uh, when the, the uh, target is more dangerous than what we're used to dealing with. They may have a, a, a big history of violence, weapons, stuff of that nature. Um, but we still have to execute a search warrant on a, on a case, and we need to get in there and try to secure the place safely. So that's when they're used. Uh, then again, in March of last year, they had another barricaded uh, suicidal homicidal subject on West Perry Street. Again, the, the uh, crisis negotiation team, which is our negotiators and special response team deployed. Um, that one was actually, luckily, was resolved without any, any uh, force being used. I think, uh, if I remember correctly, the person uh, surrendered after the negotiators got them to, uh, got them talked out. Uh, as far as our criminal division goes, um, they handled 81 new cases last year and closed 91. Uh, some of those cases are holdovers from 2019. Uh, 
that, that those uh, cases resulted in 22 arrested adults for 27 felony violations and 18 misdemeanors. Three juveniles were arrested for six felony violations and two misdemeanors. Um, the, the criminal division handles a lot of our major cases that take a lot of time. Uh, in, they take a lot of time to investigate and they can actually cross over different jurisdictions where the normal patrol officer can't just leave the city tip and to go interview a suspect, you know, two counties away. That's what our detectives can do. Um, and, and again, these are the big cases that they handle. Uh, you can see some of the charges range from rape, sexual imposition, unlawful sex with a minor, gross sexual imposition, abduction, aggravated theft, receiving stolen property, breaking and entering, felonious assault. Um, so again, some of these cases take uh, weeks, if not months, to investigate when you're trying to track down a suspect that that is absconded from the area. You got to question them or try to get evidence from them. So they do a great job, and uh, they're they're all they're all really motivated officers that that, that love doing the investigations. Uh, last year, we actually invested some money and we, we remodeled our processing room. Um, so we have all new uh, fingerprinting equipment, fuming tank for fuming for fingerprints. Um, there's just a couple of photos of it right there. Uh, big, the big tank with the glass doors actually uh, for drying uh, objects that may have blood and stuff on them. You can't package them when they're wet because they can deteriorate the evidence. So they have to be dried out in a biohazard tank like that. And, and then, they, then they can be packaged safely to preserve the evidence. So, um, our drug task force actually uh, moved into a new location last year. Uh, our Sanka County Metro's drug task force consists of the Tippin Police Department, the Sanka County Sheriff's Department or Sheriff's Office, Foster Area Police Department, BCI and I has an agent assigned to our to our task force, and we actually have an intelligence agent from the Ohio National Guard uh, assigned to our to our unit. Um, last year's drug cases again they're. They were still up um, in the city of Fall Story. We handled 76 drug cases on the drug task force, 87 in the city of Tiffin, 26 out in the state county, and then 21 out of county. The out of county is a lot of times when we would uh, develop information, we will work with other task forces, DEA, BCI. Um, so we actually do travel outside the county sometime uh, when we can link a suspect uh, from another county to our, to our city, our county. Yeah, just some more stats there. You know, most of our most of our drug offenders are repeat offenders. Um, 42 first time offenders last year, and I believe that says 139 repeat offenders. Um, this is a this is a case that uh, a, a, a case that we handle frequently. Uh, last year, our drug overdoses exploded. We we tripled our overdose cases last year compared to 2019. Last year, we responded to 20, or I'm sorry, 71 drug overdose calls. Um, unfortunately, nine of those overdoses turned out to be fatal. Um, these are pretty in-depth cases. Um, when we're trying to track down who sold the drugs, the person that died, it involves a lot of uh, evidence gathering search warrants to, to get that evidence to uh, try to prosecute. Again, uh, just a comparison of our drug overdoses, as you can see from 2019, we handled less than 30, and last year, again, we handled 71. 2018, we handled less than 30. 2017, we handled 40 was the highest year in comparison to last year. So um, last year, we also didn't have a, a deputy from the Sheriff's Department working the task force. Uh, Sheriff Stevens has now reassigned the uh, deputy to work full-time with their drug task force. So we're hoping that, uh, that this year through uh, education and enforcement, we can hopefully bring those numbers down because it's, it's uh, it's not fun when you have to go make a notification of somebody whose kid died of an overdose. Uh, just some uh, recognition of our of our officers last year. Um, we always like to make sure that our officers. We have uh, several awards in our department we give out. Um, the first one we uh, gave to officer, or I'm sorry, to Sergeant Rob Bohr, um, as far as uh, meritorious service. Um, the rest of the awards are kind of self-explanatory, but um, this one is is actually not too many people in the department get this award. It's, uh, it's basically given on their overall contributions made during their career, and uh, it's uh, given for their exceptional leadership and their service that they bring to the community. It's, a, it's awarded any officer performing outstand, outstanding meritorious service and uh, demonstrates sound leadership. Anybody who knows Sergeant Bohr um, knows he's, he's a great guy, and uh, he's, he's one heck of a leader here in the police department. Um, 
couple of the other awards we got, Lightning Bowls Award, we had two officers, again, recover a couple of stolen vehicles last year when they apprehended the person that, that stole it. Uh, that would be Sergeant Jake Monty and Sergeant Boer. Um, senior Leadership Award was given to, I should say, Detective James Chandler. Um, James Chandler actually took over for uh, retired uh, Detective Charles Boyer. And uh, uh, Jim is now uh, leading, or he's our, he's an, our officer assigned to the Drug Task Force. Um, we had community service, one community service award that was Officer Justin Nowak. Um, that was for performing an outstanding job uh, talking a female person intent on harming herself off a roof. Um, he did a great job on that case. Um, we had a, a life saving award by Sergeant McDowell. Um, he actually did a great job tracking down a, uh, a, a missing person who would, uh, was suicidal and actually found that subject after he ingested a bunch of drugs. Um, and then and that subject actually called and left me a voicemail thanking uh, Sergeant McDowell for, for saving his life. We had, uh, was it one, two, three, four, five officers last year get their uh, perfect attendance award, three of their first time awards, uh, Officer Andrew Stevens, Officer Marcus Summer, and Officer Elizabeth Miller. Sergeant Scott McDowell got his seventh award and uh, Officer Michael Moore got his eighth award, which is uh, pretty impressive. Uh, Officer Moore has been here just a little over eight years. And in that entire time, he's not used a single hour of sick leave. The guy is, uh, when, you, when, you, when he's scheduled to be here, he's gonna be here without question. Um, last year, we got a lot of donations. It was pretty nice from the community. Uh, it, it's always good around the holidays. We always get all kinds of stuff from, from from the restaurants and stuff here in Tiffin. So we're always really appreciative. We try to post that stuff on Facebook to give them a shout out and thanking them for, for their donations. And uh, it's really appreciated. Um, the Simons family, uh, or Simmons family, I'm sorry, made a bunch of masks for us here last year at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so we try to make sure we get, you know, photographs of that, put it on Facebook, our Facebook page to give recognition to those people for doing what they do. I don't know if all of you guys know Cowboy, um, Glenn, he's, uh, he's kind of like a lifelong friend of the Tiffin Police Department. He, uh, when he used to be able to get around town, he'd stop up here in his cowboy hat. I, I, I know on occasions, uh, retired Sergeant Brian Bryant would pick him up literally on holidays when he ended up working and bring him to the station for, for lunch or for dinner. Um, this last year, I know, uh, I think it was, I believe Dispatcher Cunningham got him a little refrigerator for his, uh, for his room out there at, uh, at the Automobile Care Center, but Glenn, oh, sorry. Glenn, Glenn calls in frequently to dispatch and uh, the dispatchers will sit there and have a conversation with them and uh, just uh, been, been around since my entire career and before that. Uh, just some, uh, some goals and plans for 2021. We're looking to hopefully change our, our record database. Um, currently we are using a, a system since 2006 that's actually based on a server. We're trying to get more to a cloud-based system um, for security issues and, and backup. Um, we'd like to get our increased training hours. Last year in 2020, after the pandemic hit, almost all training was canceled uh, everywhere in the state. You know, there was no in-person training, um, and that's very important. Our officers go to a lot of training to keep up to date on current tactics and, and best practices. So we're, we're, we're slowly getting people back in the, with the, everything opening back up. There started to be more in-person training We'd also want to get, uh, again, restart our, our citizen programs, like our bike rallies we have for kids, um, Safety City that we do every year, and then our, our, citizens, our citizens Academy we do here at the police department. And uh, by the end of the year, or hopefully before the end of the year, we'd also like to get a, a new chief hired. So that's about all I have for you tonight. Anybody have any questions or comments or anything they want to ask? I'm sorry. Oh, yes, Councilman yeah. Jones. Yes, uh, Chief Windsor. I heard you say that an average of 12 911 calls per day. Now, I guess a 911 call to me is an emergency, not just some concern. And I'm not asking for a breakdown, but what can be done to cut down these 911 calls? 12 a day just sounds like a lot. Uh, I mean, there's really nothing we can do to cut down on this, is whatever whatever a citizen experience out there, if they feel it's an emergency, they can call 911. Now we have had people that have abused it and called 911 that are not emergencies. We usually just try to educate them. However, we, do, we have had at least one individual, one individual this last year that we did arrest for misusing 911. Um, but again, it's, it's hard to cut down 
it's hard to cut down on something that, that that's just human nature. If, they, if somebody feels it's an emergency and they feel they're going to call 911, we're going to field those calls. Thank you. Chief Windsor, in, in my notes, the oldest uh, vehicles I can find are 1963 Mercury police cruisers. <laughs> I'll try to make it my mission to find the uh, make and model of the first first uh, Tiffin police cruiser. Yeah, if you do that, let me know. Any other questions for Chief Windsor? Councilman Jones. Yes, uh, thank you. This is not related to his uh, State of the State 2021 update here, but these two police vehicles we're going to talk about in the future about donating to the sheriff's department the tiffin police department does not need those is that a correct statement yeah these are these are 2016 ford tauruses um they're again they they we go by a cycle here so they're at the they're the year to be rotated out for the two new cars coming in this year um they they have just under 100 you know a little under 100,000 miles on them um, they're a little smaller, so that's why I don't think they got as many miles. Um, but we would just take them out of service, and and uh, if we didn't have a use for them, we'd just try to sell them on gov deals or something. But um, Sheriff Stevens and I have spoken, and I understand his his uh, his need right now for those vehicles. Again, so we would not be using them; we would be taking them out of service. Um, so again, we would we would ask council to look at that and really seriously consider transferring those to the sheriff's department, uh, given their need for the vehicles. I know Sheriff Stevens has ordered new vehicles. However, um, if, if you know what's going on in the auto industry right now, there's no idea when those are gonna come in uh, because of the part shortages and stuff. So um, we can talk about that later, but yeah, they're, they're in desperate need for them. Actually, Chief, I think that'd be a, a wonderful idea to talk about now, uh, perhaps for the audience at home and any council members. Um, the Sheriff's Department obviously is a, is a mutual aid partner with us. Uh, would you mind maybe explaining what what that entails? Um, yeah, basically anytime they, if they need assistance because they have a lot of, you know, areas around Tiffin that that they, uh, that's not in the city limits, but if they call us for mutual aid, we will respond if they're busy and they're tied up because frequently the Sheriff's Department may only have two, at the most three deputies working it to cover the entire county. Um, where we're more fortunate in the city, we are minimum manning um, is three officers. Um, however, between 11 in the morning and five at night, our minimum man is four. So we, we usually have more manpower so we can respond to assist them. But at the same time, um, if, if we need help and uh, we will call them, they'll respond as mutual aid to assist us. Um, again, I know they're speaking with Sheriff Stevens, their vehicle fleet right now, like 70, I think 60 or 70% of the vehicles have 190,000 plus over 200,000 miles on them. I know he's spent uh, I know this, uh, but um, one car alone is from $6,000 on a car that had 190,000 miles on it just to keep it on the street because um, he doesn't have anything else to replace it with. So it's just spending a lot of a lot of county uh, taxpayer money on vehicles that should have been retired a long time ago. Uh, and, they're, and they're getting to the point where they're unsafe. Um, and, and we have the opportunity where we have newer vehicles with less miles um, that I think would, would definitely benefit them. So you'd say the... <clears throat> And I, I, you know, I would certainly agree with this, but that investment with a mutual aid partner like the sheriff's department is going to pay more dividends than whatever we could get on gov deals. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you can't put a price on a, on a person's safety, and if and if we need help um, because we can't, we don't have maybe we have somebody tied up somewhere else they can't get there. Um, I would hate to I would hate to see an officer not get help uh, in, a, in a bad situation because because we couldn't get back up. So I don't think you can put a price on that. Yeah, absolutely agreed. Uh, any other questions for Chief Windsor? Councilman Leppard. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I noticed the one picture of the dispatchers, the four girls looked awful young. Is that because of the stress involved for a dispatcher and they may move on after years? Um, we have over the years had a little bit of a turnover rate in there. I have never really kept track of how of how much it is. Um, we currently have one dispatcher who's been here, I believe, close to 23 years, 22, 23 years. 
Um, the next one after that probably has 10 or 11 years on a bet. So yeah, there's a little bit more turnover rate in there. Um, it's, again, it's a very stressful job and, and also the, yeah, the hours aren't always the greatest. Uh, you know, you, you can't, we have to work nights and weekends and, and that's not always the most pleasant thing to do. Um, especially with some of the, some of the younger people that are starting families to get to work every weekend and work midnight shift is, is not always fun. Thank you. Yes, I did. Council on Miana Tuna. Thank you. Uh, Chief, I would just like to comment that we've been having conversations starting on bringing back safety week. And so it's looking pretty positive. We're not positive it's going to happen, but it's looking good. And so we hope to be back at it for our eighth year in September. So thanks for the shout out on that. So we're really looking forward to it. We think it's really needed and just happy that we think we can do it again. Nope, we're, uh, we're looking forward to it. I know Sergeant Watson, uh, who always done, has done a great, he's done a fantastic job running the Citizens Academy, the bike rodeos in Safety City. He's he's invaluable on, on, on that stuff. And uh, I know he's really looking forward to getting back out. And we really appreciate all the all the people that went through the Citizens Academy that continue to volunteer at our safety cities and our bike rodeos. Um, it's just, it's really great to see those people keep coming back. Any other questions for Chief Windsor? Councilman Perry. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, first off, just wanna say um, good presentation, uh, Chief. Um, a lot of good information. Um, thanks for all you do for the uh, city. Um, done a great job since taking over. Um, I think a lot of people would, would agree. Um, I, for one, would be in favor of, um, you know, given the sheriff, the uh, the cruisers, I think uh, I see a beneficial, uh, you know, benefit, it'd be beneficial for both parties in my, in my mind. Um, and then a little off topic, I know uh, Councilman Gillig will lead our history tour sometimes, and he'll often um, bring up a few stories about uh, the um, few officers that have, uh, that have passed away um, while they have been serving the city. Uh, so when you have, when you get a second, uh, maybe uh, pick his brain for those stories is pretty, uh, pretty interesting. So that's all I got. I, I believe they celebrate um, or or honor their end of watch dates every year, if I'm not mistaken, right, Chief? Yeah, um, actually, last week we just uh, had Police Memorial Week, so um, you know that stuff's always recognized every year. The the week of, I believe it's May 11th to the 15th or 16th, something like that. I couldn't be the exact dates off my head right now. It changes every year, but it's the third week in May. And, and yes, and actually on the, the dates, I believe, of their, their passing, we try to, to uh, honor them at the memorial. And... Uh, Marshal August Schultz and Officer Patrick Sweeney are their names. Um, both remarkable heroes, remarkable stories. Um, well, Chief, I'd, I'd just like to thank you for everything your department does. Um, one of the things I talk about on the bike tour um, with the pedal company is you know, typically if you're seeing a police officer, those, those folks are having, you know, a, a pretty difficult day and that's got to be very taxing mentally. Um, so I'm just, I'm very appreciative for your efforts and the department's efforts and keeping our friends and neighbors safe. Thank you. We all appreciate that. Any additional questions or comments for Chief Windsor? Seeing no hands, I would like to thank the chief for his time this evening. And I'll turn it back over to Acting Mayor Folt. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, that concludes my remarks. If anybody has any questions. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chief, and thank you, Acting Mayor Folt. We'll move on to Clerk of Council and Forrest. No report tonight, Mr. President. Thank you. Director of Finance, Kathy Kaufman. No report, Mr. President. Thank you. And Director of Law, Brent T. Howard. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, President Gillig. Um, wanted to report on the um, 
uh, the work of the Charter Review Commission. Uh, they have their final meeting, um, scheduled final meeting for May tw uh, 26th at six o'clock via Zoom. Uh, their intention is to approve a written report of all of their uh, proposed changes to the charter. That report then will be submitted to you, City Council, um, and it'll be part of your packet for your next regular meeting, which is scheduled for June the 7th. Um, they have discussed uh, that they desire to have uh, a meeting with the uh, council so that um, you have a little time to digest uh, the written report, but then uh, you could have a committee of the whole with them. Uh, you don't have to schedule it today. Uh, at one of their meetings recently, they did um, suggest that they know that you meet on Monday evenings and that this might be a topic for a committee of the whole, uh, perhaps the last, uh, the fourth Monday of the month of June. So it's something for you to consider. Um, and what it would be, the, the format would be a couple of um, members of the commission, probably the chair and at least one other would attend. I would be there, the mayor who's attended most of the meetings, if not all the meetings, and we would, um, um, they would give a, a presentation of the proposals and then answer any questions that uh, council may have as you consider uh, what to then pass along to the voters. So uh, please consider um, uh, scheduling a committee of the whole probably at your next uh, meeting, but possibly the fourth Monday of uh, the month of June, which is the 28th. Any questions about charter review? Councilman Perkins. Um, I've been active on those and I just had a question on the procedure here. So they're gonna make recommendations, submit those to us, and then we are going to sift through those and pick and choose what we believe needs to go to the ballot, correct? That is correct. Yeah, you okay. make the final decision. You will divide them up too, um, based on subject matter. So it okay. may, what it will look like, uh, Councilman Perkins, is that you will have um, possibly multiple um, questions. So on the ballot, there may be six to 10 different questions asked to um, the, the voters. And so they may, and they'll approve them by subject matter. So they don't have to accept, you know, it's not all or nothing. It's each issue based on subject matter will be voted on up or down. And that's the way then council will pass ordinances that will um, suggest those uh, those issues to be considered. You have to meet a deadline. There's a deadline in August, and I, I don't have it right in front of me, but I will have that for you at your next meeting in which you must submit those to the Board of Elections to timely be placed on the ballot in November. Okay, thank you. Councilman Jones. Thank you, Mr. Gillig. Uh, I think yesterday, the day before I looked and somewhere, and I'm not that website savvy, but somewhere I located and I looked back and you can see all the suggested changes ahead of time. And there, and uh, Audrey Flood does a nice job highlighting them in red or green, whatever the color coding is. But can't the public look at those ahead of time and see some of the suggested changes that we're talking about? Uh, they, they can. Um, the written report that will be presented will to council um, at the next meeting will have all the suggested changes. So um, hopefully, you know, there'll be 60 plus days that the public will have access to that information and can comment to uh, council as a whole or individually about what they uh, think is appropriate to, to suggest to the voters. Very good. Thank you, Law Director Howard. Thank you, and that concludes my report. Very good. We'll now move on to written communications, uh, Council Clerk and Forrest. Thank you, Mr. President. I have Mayor's request for legislation number 21-10 uh, for the vehicles for the Seneca County Sheriff's Office. That request, Mayor's request for legislation 21-10 will be referred to the Materials and Equipment Committee and Councilman Jones, if we could attempt to get that scheduled before our next meeting, I think that would be very beneficial. Thank you very much. 
Then I also have finance director's request for legislation number F21-18 to amend the 2021 budget ordinance 21-11 to appropriate funds into the sewer maintenance budget. The amount is $96,968,000. Finance director's request for legislation F21-18 will be held on file in the clerk of council office as legislation has been prepared this evening in the form of ordinance 21-44. And I'd like to again, thank uh, Chairman Leopard and the members of the street sidewalks and sewer committee uh, for their very excellent work with that. That concludes the written communications, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Clerk Forrest. We are now under oral communication. Anyone wishing to address council may use the raise hand feature on your Zoom and Mr. Dutro will let you in. Uh, if you could identify yourself and you are more than welcome to dialogue with members of council. I see we have Mr. Horniman. Thank you, council president. I will go ahead and let him in. Mr. Horniman, you're like Tiffin royalty related to the Good Brothers and, and the Fox himself. I just saw the neat uh, Seneca County Historical Society post today. Scott, you are still muted. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you very much. I saw that and yeah. I. I saw that post and I have a, a couple of their old postcards and stuff from the old good office supply that I try to find and get them on and everything. My great grandfather or my great great grandfather was the youngest brother of like nine and the oldest one was Will Good, who was the <laughs> one that did the, the good printing company and such and everything. So... <laughs> But yeah, uh, thank you very much for um, for the opportunity, Mr. President and Mr. Acting Mayor and uh, members of council. Um, I you probably guessed I'm going to speak on the the traffic lights and the ordinances that are coming up specifically for me. I live on North Sandusky Street, so my concern mostly is for the traffic light at um, Hall Street and North Sandusky and the removal of that. Um, I just wanted to speak on it. Uh, I know there's been a lot of disagreement on um, this. So actually, I'm going to address things that I think we all can agree on, rather than pointing out any of the disagreements and try to <laughs> do that. But um, with it, as all of you did receive, we did a petition in the neighborhood, and I did a petition in the neighborhood where we had a signatures of 142 local residents that were two to three blocks in the community that live from that intersection. We had 142 residents that signed the petition, and three people I talked to said that they wanted to see the traffic light removed. We also got 17 signatures from uh, members of Faith United Methodist Church. I specifically separated out that petition because those people, when they put their name on the petition, their address wouldn't show up somewhere in the neighborhood. Or, and we just want, I just wanted to separate it out just so that it was something. I mean, I could have easily um, gone to Bailiwick's at seven or eight in the morning and passed out a petition and said, please sign it. You would have had addresses from all over Tiffin. I didn't think that was really noteworthy um, to show how the feelings of the residents were. Um, also, you know, with that, um, realistically, every one of you that's sitting in a council chair has had to do some petitioning in the city of Tiffin in some way, shape or form. Um, I probably averaged about one out of every three people answered their door or would, um, you know, or were home that I made contact with. So I would argue realistically that, that the residents that are in opposition of the removal of traffic light are probably closer to 300, maybe even 450. Um, if, if we were going, if I made contact with every single one of them. Um, 
we all can agree you guys are a representative government body. Um, it's your entity that's that is your role and I greatly greatly appreciate everyone's service to our community and your guidance and leadership. I just with those numbers on the petition for the Hall Street North and Dusky Street, I just think when you're making a decision, the feedback of the residents and the fact that they wanted to put their name and address on a, on a piece of paper that they knew was going to City Hall really does show and, and, and it really does make their feelings be heard. Um, Cause I did have people that, you know, I agree with you, but I don't want to put my name on something that's going to city hall. And I said, fair enough. Okay. <laughs> but just in the decision-making process, please, please make that a priority or a driving force in your decisions. Um, the other thing I wanted to speak on that I think we all can agree on I've been looking through bits and pieces of the Ohio Manual of Uniform Traffic Code, and it is not a page turner. <laughs> it's a thousand, almost a thousand pages long. But the operative word in that, um, in that manual is uniform. I think we all can agree that Tiffin, Ohio is a unique community. And we're unique in a bunch of different ways, but this is talking about traffic lights and roadways. I have racked my brain and I can't come up with another community in Northwest Ohio or the state of Ohio that has six state routes that either go through the city limits or join up in the city limits and have a national highway that skirts the outside of the city limits and has a population of 20,000 people approximately. Um, that is not, that is unique. I don't think taking recommendations and being governed by a uniform traffic code for a unique situation is really applicable. Um, in the traffic report, another thing that we can all agree on, and I've been through the manual trying to get the definitions. The traffic report states uh, at the Melmore and Circular um, intersection, as well as the North Sandusky Street and Hall Street intersection, it says that there is no school exposure. I think we all can agree that no school exposure is not the best way to describe that situation. They need to maybe put something limited, moderate school exposure, because the North Sandusky uh, traffic light comes right by TU and comes within a quarter mile of Noble School. The Melmore and Circular one goes right past the backside of Kraut and comes up right by Calvary Elementary. I just think that the wording and the way that they're rating these needs to be reviewed. And I urge everyone, and I have done it, to reach out to our state reps to have them take a look at it. Because the most revised version that I found that was readily, easily available was a 2012 version of this Ohio Manual of Uniform Traffic Code. Um, another thing I think that needs to be addressed in the traffic report and in there is the size and weight of vehicles that are going through intersections and that are coming through town, especially with the six state routes coming through town and the national highway on the outside. Um, you know, it's just, I don't think for a unique situation for Tiffin to use this uniform traffic code is the best way to go about it. It's it's something you can tell when it's written. It is a document or manual that's written by big city engineers for big city engineers. And I think the perception of what a busy intersection is in Toledo, Columbus, or Cincinnati is very different than what we consider a busy intersection in Tiffin, Ohio. And those, those towns are talking about the need for 20 traffic lights and whether those are needed. We're here, I think they said there was about a dozen that they were looking at. And I just don't think it does. Um, I really wish that, you know, the, the resident's wishes, as I said, it takes, you know, it, you can tell that someone feels strongly about something if they're gonna put their name on a document that's gonna go to city hall and be presented to the mayor and city council. And I just hope that you would respect that. I thank you very much. Um, also, just on a side note, um, I, 
at the Committee of the Whole, Councilwoman Yanisuno uh, talked about the accident on Hudson Street last Thursday night. Well, there was a truck that was going straight across Hudson and it got hit. And it was taking up the two northbound lanes of North Sandusky Street. The trucks coming over the bridge had to react immediately. They didn't have time. They went left to center and around that accident. And the only thing that kept the whole thing from becoming a big pileup and having a real major head-on collision with a semi right in front of my house was the traffic light at Hall and North Sandusky stopped the traffic. And I called the police department myself to get them out there because it was scary. So, <laughs> but yeah, thank you very much for your time. I know I went long and uh, I really, really appreciate all, uh, all that you guys do for our city. No, not at all, Scott. I appreciate all the work you've done with this and for dialoguing with council. Uh, Councilman Perry. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Um, just wanted to uh, kind of praise Scott. There are uh, a lot of good, good information, well thought out, well spoken. Um, you know, he definitely put his work in to, uh, to this issue. So I want to thank him um, for, for doing that. If you ever uh, thought about running for uh, city council someday, uh, he'd have my support. He uh, definitely is, uh, has all, a lot of the qualities that we're looking for. So. Well, thank you. <laughs> Councilman Jones. Thank you, uh, President Gilly. Uh, I did a fair amount of work on this uh, traffic signal project, but uh, I have to take my hat off to uh, Mr. Hornman. He did much, much, much more than I did. And uh, I would uh, hate to run against him for a second ward city council person. Acting Mayor Fote. Scott, I can't let you go without... Uh... Without saying hi, and uh, I, I join I join the others, and uh, you and I go go back quite a way. So, uh, good presentation, well thought out, uh, good arguments, good discussion points, and uh, I'm proud of you. So I just wanted to publicly say that uh, you did good. So thank you. Thank you very much. If I may at this time, because I will freely confess to, to being a little guilty on this myself, um, for me, where I've run into my considerations for the removal of the traffic signals, particularly with regards to Melmore and Circular and Hall and North Sandusky, I tend to fall on the side of uh, the firm that uh, conducted the study being traffic experts as well as the unanimous uh, agreement of our traffic safety committee. But what I wonder if we haven't asked enough or gathered enough information from, if I can trouble our city engineer, could you maybe expound on how removing the lights might serve to improve safety in the city, traffic safety? Correct. So um, in regards to improving safety, we looked at the existing crash data of every intersection that the study was performed. Um, we looked at crash data of other similar intersections um, where there might have previously been a traffic signal um, and compared it um, in that relationship. We also, um, you know, we we greatly appreciate all the public feedback and support and input that we received over the last two to three months that are going through this process. Um, and, and a lot of the concerns that we have seen from a lot of the residents is in regards to speed. Um, I noticed in a lot of the emails that were sent, um, people's claims were that, you know, they see vehicles speed up uh, to, to beat the light. And, um, you know, that type of statement um, might just be misperceived, but when we look at it from the outside, we're saying, basically, if you remove that signal, you, you should be maintaining that constant speed of travel um, throughout the, the whole corridor. Therefore, you won't have that rapid acceleration to beat a light, um, thus reducing the amount of crashes, thus improving the safety of the intersection. And just kind of an example to lean on, you know, when you're 
um, driving on a highway, whether it be inside city limit or most likely outside city limits like US 224 or, or the turnpike. And I, I know that's not really a good comparison, but there's not the, the stop and starts on those type of, of highway systems. And you don't have a lot of the, the rapid acceleration and, and things of that nature. And, and there's a reason for that. And um, that is the one thing with, with like these signals that we're discussing, um, people do, they speed up to beat lights. And that does increase the amount of accidents um, from the police chief study on both of the two controversial um, intersections that we've spoken in regard to. I know there was the 39 accidents in the 20 years at Hall and Sandusky. Um, and that I believe the 28 accidents were either rear end collisions or red light violations. And uh, we're just hopeful that, you know, this study, whether we went forward with it or not, and I ultimately respect city council's decision, regardless of what decision is made tonight, um, our intent and goal was to improve traffic flow and improve safety. And, and these were the recommendations we were bringing before you to improve traffic flow and improve safety because we do care about the residents of the city. And, you know, we just want to give everything a shot. Um, I'll be the first one to say, and I know a lot of council members have seen the, the silver uh, um, city engineer's truck sitting at multiple intersections Friday and Monday and, and observing the, the intersections and, and taking it all in. And I appreciate Councilman Leopard for um, pushing me to do so um, in the committee meeting last week. And I made sure that I sat out at a uh, number of intersections for multiple um, hours at a time during the peak hours and, and observed. And I'll say today, I have seen a couple red lights ran um, at the intersection of, of Melmore and Circular. Um, no crashes, um, we got by there, but you know, that could ultimately been a crash. Um, so, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, what we're proposing to do, you know, I know there was concerns in regards to skewed numbers um, with the study done in October and um, everything, like I said, is based on averages and everything changed on the, changes on a daily basis. But uh, I think the only way that we can move forward with um, trying to improve traffic flow and safety is to give it a shot. And I think we all have the same intent, whether we're all, whether we're for or against the situation is to, to have a safe environment for our residents. And I was, you know, that is the main thing that I bring to the office every day is just trying to better this community um, that I'm working for. And, you know, I'll be the first one to pull back. I'll be the first one to admit I was wrong. I'll be the first one to admit the DGL um, study might not have been right um, if these don't in fact work. Um, but that, that is our intent. Um, I know there's a lot of concerns with the pedestrian safety. So I talked about vehicular safety, but pedestrians is also another key environment. And Mr. Horneman um, made basis of proximity of these two to schools. Um, the traffic signal is not really there to, it's there to control vehicular volume unless you have a large number of pedestrians. And then at that case of traffic signal is warranted to allow the pedestrians to cross the road. But there are other safety measures that are effective um, that can be implemented to improve the pedestrian standpoint. Um, rapid flashing beacons, um, those are very um, highly used um, devices um, to control and promote pedestrian safety, especially on state highways. Um, we've implemented several of them in the city um, in the past. And what that does is it keeps traffic flow moving, um, but also promotes a, a safe environment for a pedestrian to cross the roadway and alerts motorists that there could be a pedestrian there. So um, when you have a signal, you have somebody trying to beat the light that also could create a safety issue for a pedestrian as well. Um, that pedestrian might, you know, step out into the roadway thinking that they're going to have a, that it is safe for them. And you do, you brought up the fact of heavy vehicles and the a heavier vehicle takes a longer time to stop, um, especially at a 35 mile an hour road. So a traffic, that's another standpoint to improve safety. Um, if you have a, if you have a light and it's green and you're going 35 mile an hour and that yellow comes on, and you want to stop a truck coming towards that signal, that might be very difficult to do. Um, so that, that is the other thing that I want to bring up. But 
ultimately, like I said, it's to improve safety, both pedestrians, vehicular standpoint. I saw I went on a rant there, Councilman Gillig, but uh, our intents to um, do the best thing for the residents of the city of Tiffin, whether the study is right or wrong. Um, and I respect the decision that's made tonight by city council. Thank you, city engineer Watson. Uh, Mr. Horniman, any additional comments or questions for council? No, I just thank you very much for your time. And, you know, and thanks for hearing me out. And I know that, you know, I never thought that I was going to have to go head to head with city council over a traffic light ever. That was, that would have been the furthest thing from my mind. <laughs> I honestly, when I heard about the traffic study, um, I was actually excited about it because I thought that they would recommend lowering the speed limit or routing the trucks around or something like that. I never thought that the traffic light would, the, the recommendation would be to remove the traffic light. I never thought that was going to be an option. So. Well, Scott, before you go, may I, and I don't mean to embarrass you, may I ask uh, you to share uh, the story you shared with me about how you came to really get the process started because it's a wonderful lesson <laughs> for parents such as myself yeah the whole thing i had caught the tail end of the streets and sidewalk uh committee meeting and i i was trying to listen i'm like what are they talking about and i was listening i was listening and I figured out what they were talking about and that they were talking about removing traffic lights and they were speaking on our, our traffic light out here at Hall and North Sandusky. And I went in the other room and I kind of did a little tirade a little bit about, you know, that's got to be the, da, 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 you know, and my son was in the other room and he's like, well, dad, what's going on? And I'm, I explained, you know, what they were talking about. And he flat out looked at me and goes, well, what are you going to do about it? And I've always explained to my son to, if he's going to complain to complain in a constructive manner and have solutions and compromises in mind before you open your mouth and just, you know, otherwise you're just complaining. And so basically it was a wonderful parenting moment where I got to put my foot in my mouth and he looked at me and what are you going to do about it? Well, I guess I, you know, fired off an email to Councilman Jones and I already realized that I'm like, I'm probably going to have to go door to door and talk to people and get signatures and explain the situation. <laughs> Outstanding. Well, again, Scott, thank you so much for all of your work with us and for coming and uh, dialoguing with council this evening. Well, absolutely. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay, anyone else from the attending public that would like to dialogue with council, please feel free to use the raise hand feature. Council President, I'm not seeing any hands raised. Okay. Very good. Well, we will go ahead and move on to motions. Do we have any motions this evening? Councilman Perry. Just a question. If we were to um, make a motion to table um, the circular and the Hall Street, um, this would be the time to do that, right? Or no? We would do that when we read it? Law director. Yeah, a, a motion to table would take precedence at any time. Um, so it could be done now. It could be done after the reading of the um, of the third reading of the ordinance. It could even be done um, when you're considering a motion to pass the ordinance. So a uh, motion to table takes precedent over any of those, um, uh, in, in any of those situations. So it's up to council when, um, if you'd like to consider that kind of motion. All right, thanks law director. Very good. Do we have any motions at this time? Seeing none, we will move on to resolutions and ordinances. We have resolution number 21-9 introduced by Ben Gillig, resolution expressing strong support for the Transformation Life Center established by the Seneca County Council on Home Homelessness Incorporated. <clears throat> that is the first and only reading of resolution 
dash nine. Uh, with my current role this evening, Councilman Perkins, uh, would you mind considering asking for passage? Yes, um, I would like to ask for passage of resolution 21-9 um, this evening. Very good, we have a motion to pass resolution 21-9. Do we have a second? Councilwoman Boyle. I'll second, Mr. President. Thank you, we have a motion and a second to pass resolution 21-9. Any discussion? Very good, Council Clerk will take the roll. Councilman Perry. Steve yes. had a question. Oh. oh, Councilman Leopard, my apologies. I just like to say I never enjoyed a committee meeting more than I enjoyed that one. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty it was a good fun. time. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions or comments? Very good. Uh, Council Clerk Forrest, if you wouldn't mind. Councilman Perry. Yes. Councilwoman Boyle. Yes. Gillig. Yes. Yanatuno? Yes. Jones? Yes. Leopard? Yes. And Perkins? Yes. Resolution 21-9 is passed by a vote of 7 to 0. Ordinance number 21-32 introduced by Steve Leopard, ordinance approving the removal of a traffic signal and the installation of stop signs at the intersection of circular and main streets within the city. That is the third reading of ordinance 21-32. Councilman Leppard. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I would ask for passage of ordinance number 21-32. We have a motion for passage of ordinance 21-32. Do we have a second? Councilwoman Iannatuno. I'll second, Mr. President. We have a motion and a second for passage of ordinance 21-32. Is there any discussion? Councilman Jones. Thank you, President Gilly. I have not received one phone call, one email, one comment about the stoplight at Circular and Main Street. So I just wanted to uh, share that with the group before we vote. Thank you, Councilman Jones. Any additional comments or questions? Council Clerk will please take the roll on Ordinance 21-32. Councilman Perry. Yes. Boyle. Yes. Gillig. Yes. Yanatuno. Yes. Jones. Yes. Leopard. Yes. And Perkins. Yes. Ordinance 21-32 is approved by a vote of seven to zero. Ordinance number 21-33 introduced by Steve Leopard. Ordinance approving the removal of a traffic signal and installation of stop signs at the intersection of Circular and Melmore Streets within the city. That is the third reading of Ordinance 21-33. Councilman Leopard. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I would ask for consideration of Ordinance number 21-33. We have a motion for consideration of Ordinance 21-33. Do we have a second? Councilwoman Iannatuno. Second, Mr. President. We have a motion and a second for consideration of Ordinance 21-33. Do we have any discussion? Any questions? Councilman Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'm a little foggy. What is a consideration? Help me out here because uh, that's a new term here in city council to myself. Councilman Leopard. I guess the short of it is uh, vote as you see fit. Okay, thank you. Um, Councilwoman Yamatuno. Thank you, Mr. President. Actually, my comments will actually involve the other intersection also. I guess all my years on school board, we were taught to not micromanage, and I feel that's the same thing with city council. And you made comments the other night that we hire people to make these decisions. And we have an outstanding city engineer, um, outstanding superintendent of public works, chief of police, chief of fire, the mayor, the city administrator. I sat in on that meeting. They were very thoughtful in their conversation and discussion on this. And I don't feel it's, in my personal opinion, I don't feel it's right to supersede their opinions with ours. 
this is what they do for a living. They want to keep the city safe. And I, I just don't agree with going against them. The mayor made a suggestion at our committee of the whole meeting about going ahead and trying it. And Matt Watson even offered to pull it if he didn't think it was working. I'm not sure why we're holding it up. Um, give it a try. And he said he'll be the first one to pull it if it doesn't work. Thank you. Very well said. Um, Councilman Jones and Councilman Perkins, I'd just like to ask uh, City Engineer Watson very briefly to review uh, for those watching the timeline for removal. It's not that Circular and Melmore will be gone tomorrow. Correct. Uh, thank you, uh, President Gillig. So um, the process that we would follow is that the signal would be signed saying that there is a traffic study in place. Um, we would place the signal into flash um, per the re recommendation that we, be, we would be proposing. So a four-way stop would flash red in all directions. A two-way stop would flash red in two directions. So that signal would operate in flash for a minimum of 90 days. Um, after the 90 day, minimum 90 day flashing process, the signal would be bagged for then a minimum of 60 days. Um, during that minimum of 150 day process, um, the signal would be observed um, frequently um, by uh, members of the traffic safety committee. Um, I, th I feel um, it is my due diligence that I've kind of been kind of one of the spoke people, spoke persons for the uh, traffic safety committee that I would continue to uh, devote time uh, to make sure that I observe the traffic flow um, multiple times on various days um, of various weeks um, throughout that 150 day process. Um, also during that 150 day process, um, the traffic safety committee meets monthly um, I think each stakeholder of the traffic safety committee has an obligation to bring uh, their insights and their knowledge to the traffic safety committee meetings, being that we all proposed that unanimously recommendation um, to provide that insight and gather that evidence, how it fits their department over that 150 day process. So, you know, the, the police chief would bring any crash data over that last 30 days to each um, traffic safety committee meeting. Um, I think it's the obligation of the of the engineer that runs public works uh, public works as well as myself to, uh, to monitor traffic flow and, and potential traffic backups. Um, so so that's the process. Um, also, I've talking I've spoken to uh, the public works superintendent Brandon Burner. Obviously, we're just it's not feasible just to go out and flip them on flash um, next week. Um, when I made the proposal um, to city council through. Uh, the first committee of the whole meeting, as well as the second committee of the whole meeting, I made the, um, the I started the discussion with there were site distance issues um, at some of the intersections and there needed to be some um, items performed in order to open up those site distances, um, ops, obstructions and ultimately improve the safety. So um, signs need to be moved, um, stop signs need to be installed. Um, so at this time, I wouldn't even, we, we've kind of delayed the process, which is fine. I wouldn't even foresee that any of these signals would go into flash until probably sometime in July. Um, also with talking to um, the public works superintendent, I also kind of feel, and maybe we'll have this discussion further at our next traffic safety committee meeting, depending on um, the decision made by city council this evening. But um, I also don't feel that we should implement the flash on all four signals potentially at the same time either. I think we should strategically um, implement throughout the city. So maybe one week we do one signal, the next week we implement the next, um, just so it's not a, a shell shock to the city as, uh, that you have multiple signals that are changing operation all at one time. Um, I don't think that I don't think that's going to cause any issues. The timeline's not going to matter. We're going to start, we would start the process after school has ended and the process would still be continuing uh, multiple months into the, the beginning of the next school year. So um, that's the process in a whole, um, you know, it's going to continue to be monitored, um, but we want to make sure that we get those upfront items that we have to make sure that they are safe um, before we were to implement. 
Thank you, City Engineer Watson. Uh, Councilman Jones, uh, thank you for your patience. Oh, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, President. What was I going to say now? Uh, Should have given you some warning. My apologies. That's all right. I, I withdraw my uh, hand up. Uh, Councilman Perkins, did you have a comment or question? Yeah, this is one of the lights I was a little hesitant on, uh, only because I live closer to it. So I drive this route religiously. I've seen Matt every day, um, who's putting in the work down there. <laughs> um, but what I've realized over time of really paying attention to it is it it has a really bad traffic flow issue because of the light. Uh, there's a lot of turning going on from Circular Street onto Melmore uh, for school or whatnot in the mornings between probably, I think it's 7.30, 8.30, somewhere in there. And, uh, you know, I've sat through the light two to three times on circular because someone's trying to turn left or turn right or whatever it is. And uh, once I do get through there, I'll see somewhere between seven to 15 cars on both sides of Melmore trying to get through. Um, so I, you know, I'm for, I'm for the study on this one. Over time, it's kind of won me over. I think it would help the traffic flow a lot as long as we're taking the precautions like uh, Matt said with uh, the crosswalks and making it safe for the pedestrians and the school children, you know, especially going to Columbia and going to Kraut and things like that. I'm, I'm okay with it. I think it will be, uh, I think it would do a lot of good down there on Melmore Street and keep that really flowing because with the stop signs over there on Sandusky Street, that intersection goes right through fast constantly, but I always get stopped on Melmore for a while. Um, you know, I know Danny has that house on the corner, so he's been there a lot more lately and uh, it's busy. It's real busy, but uh, I, I kind of think the traffic needs to go or else you, you just feel like you never get through that intersection in the morning. But, you know, I could be wrong, but I, I, I think I think the, the change is probably good. Thank you, Councilman Perkins. Any additional questions or comments? Councilman Boyle. Yeah, thanks, Mr. President. So I just want to be clear in the 150 uh, day timeline, is that the time frame and the only time frame then that council has to revert back to the original structure? Or if after that 150 days is up and we see issues a year from now, would we still have the opportunity to do so? I think that's an excellent question, Mr. Law Director. Yeah, city council at any time could um, override the city administrator's decision or even its decision. If you make a decision this evening or anytime soon, you could make changes based on new information um, to reverse a decision, let's say, that you make. Councilwoman Boyle? Sorry, yeah, thank you for that. And then, so I guess I'm just trying to understand the difference then if we were to table this and move forward and test it versus approving it and moving forward. I, I almost feel like that's our same testing period as well. So um, I just want to make sure I'm not missing uh, some uh, major difference, I guess, there. Yeah, that's, that's certainly understandable. Um, and I suppose, you know, I, I've thought about this uh, a number of times uh, if it's something we're, we're concerned with, worrying about this being a testing period, um, and I guess voting to approve it would, would imply uh, approval, um, for lack of a better term. So that's, that's very understandable. Uh, Law Director, may I ask for a little insight on that as well? Yeah, I, th I think as you're framing it, um, Councilwoman Boyle, there are two, um, two alternatives. Uh, one is to pass the legislation, which is an approval. You understand the process and you've heard that there'll be additional information that the city engineer will gather and observe and can provide if there seems to be a concern or a problem from inside the city or outside, I guess you can then respond to that by taking action with new legislation to change the, um, uh, the traffic control device to add a signal back to that location. So that's one process. The other is to table this motion um, 
again, go through the same process that has been described and then gather more information. But then um, if you would want to remove the traffic control signal, um, uh, given the process we've started, it would come back to council to have to take that action. You'd have to take it off the table and take the action to approve the ordinance where the, the first alternative that I described, the action's already been done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Law Director. And at the risk of editorializing, I get the feeling that City Engineer Watson and City Minister Thornton, Mayor Monts, uh, Chief Windsor, uh, Chief Chapel would, would be pounding on our doors in the middle of the night if they suspected anything um, to be problematic with any of these at the risk of editorializing. So my apologies for that. Any additional comments or questions? Councilman Perry. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, obviously, I think with these kind of issues, um, you're only going to hear from people that are against them. I don't think people that are uh, in favor of removing the lights are going to take the time to um, reach out to any of us in, in support of uh, removing the light. We're only going to hear from people that are against it. Um, with that being said, I've I've yet to hear um, one person that is in favor of taking out circular Melmore. Um, if we go ahead with the vote tonight, I would probably vote it down. I, I would be in favor of um, tabling it and, and seeing what it looks like before we pass it. Um, that would be my recommendation. I don't know. I would like to throw that out in discussion, um, what you guys would think about um, maybe tabling it and, and see it in, um, in action uh, this summer. Um, I just don't see the, the why we have to rush this. You know, we have nothing but time, um, I, you know, and then we can make the right decision instead of just, you know, kind of throwing it up on the wall and, and saying, all right, let's vote tonight, you know, so um, that would be my my recommendation. And um, I just want to throw that out for whatever other people think. Councilman Leopard. Is there going to be a traffic study done uh, like uh, DGL had done before? Are we going to rely on our own employees to uh, give us the information? I'd like to refer that to City Administrator Thornton. Obviously, if council wanted another study done, the traffic safety committee could uh, do that study. If it's not going to change anyone's mind at the end of the day, I uh, would recommend that we not spend the taxpayers money to do a second study if it's going to be based on uh, not going to be based on the results of the study. So if we did a second study, the results came back the same and it doesn't change anybody's mind, we've wasted the $4,500 to do the study. Uh, however, if we do the study and the facts come back and they say, you know, the first study was done in October, this one has different statistics and it tells us different information, that would be valuable. So I think it goes, you know, the question is, and I heard Mr. Horneman say, and I think resident input is important, but I think we also need to be careful not to, uh, have the residents drive where traffic lights should be by popular vote. It's not, in my view, an issue of popular vote. It's understanding the traffic flow, understanding what the studies tell us, and then doing that period of 150 days of study and coming back and saying, wait a minute, there is an issue here and we shouldn't change this or not. We have to remember this is the beginning of the process, not the end, that what we're recommending is to during that 150 days, every 30 days, the Traffic Safety Committee will look at the data that we're receiving and bring that data back to the council to say, here's what we're seeing. And it indicates either we made the right decision or maybe we made the wrong decision based on what we see. Uh, the reason we came to council with a recommendation and not just to implement it was that we did want council's input and hoped that council would be considerate of the, the information that was gathered at that point. We may find something different if we go through this 150 days and change our mind. Thank you, City Administrator Thornton. Councilman Leopard. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, 
Uh, I had the same conversation with uh, President Vogt today, and it was my opinion if we do have another traffic study and the numbers say that the traffic light is not warranted, to be a responsible councilman, we would have to vote yes because we're wasting city dollars. Uh, when I asked the Traffic Safety Committee how many people actually went out and observed traffic, I didn't get a single hand raised. Nobody was out there. They're taking, they're taking all their information from science, I guess, uh, a DGL study. Well, you know, I kind of think the common sense has to come into play somewhere at some point in time. I did my due diligence. Uh, I spent about three hours on Melmore Street. I spent 11 hours on Sandusky Street counting traffic. And uh, I've, I've actually have seen what happens there. And uh, I will not be in favor of uh, tabling this ordinance tonight. Councilman Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. First off, I want to give a shout out to Councilman Perry for asking the other six of us what we think. Uh, thank you for doing that. And since you're asking me what I'm thinking, and I, uh, what did Councilman Leopard say? Oh, I considered my vote tonight on this ordinance 2133. And since no one has contacted me with a positive comment, no one has contacted me with a negative comment, I believe we should go with the experts and uh, do that. And what was the last one? No one considered. I guess that's it. So, uh, oh, I'm sorry. The last thing is I am not in favor of tabling this. It's either a yes or no. Let's either go with removing the traffic light at Sikkim, Circular and Melmore or leave it in. So those are my feedback. I'd like to thank uh, Councilman Jones and Councilman Leopard for their thoughts and valuable insight as always. Councilman Perkins. Uh, the last thing that would go into my decision on this uh, intersection is that I've had one person reach out to me about this intersection um, and they were kind of on the fence more towards the, I don't think we should get rid of it um, after discussing with them and not in a persuasive way at all because I didn't know what I wanted to do um, we both kind of came to the same kind of conclusion that it's worth trying. It, we think that it would help the intersection. Um, that's just my opinion. Um, you know, I respect everyone's opinion on this and it's going off the study. I, I want to go off the study hundred percent. The problem is, is everyone can go back and say, well, it was done during the pandemic. We keep getting into that. And that's especially going to come up on the next one, uh, especially when 200 residents, you know, are telling you that they do not want that light gone. They are scared. Um, you know, I can't comfort that and I can't go against that either. So, but yeah, for this one, you know, I, I'm fine to vote on it. If there's, uh, yes, Councilman Leopard. Uh, thank you. The magic number on uh, Sandusky Street, Matt can help us out here was uh, 800 vehicles per hour. And uh, I came very close to 800 vehicles per hour in a three hour, in three different blocks of a one hour uh, study. Uh, and I believe the magic number on Melmore Street was 150 from Circular Street, from the Minor Street, is that correct, Matt? And we were very close, or we did exceed that, didn't we, in DGL study? To the engineer Watson. Yes, so regardless of the intersection, the, the peak hour um, traffic signal warning criteria is a total combined vehicular um, volume of 800 vehicles. So that's both major and minor um, totaled up 800 vehicles, as well as 150 on the minor road. Um, so you have to you have to hit both um, in order to meet that warrant criteria for the peak hour. Um, in regards to the Sandusky and Hall, um, we were short of the 800, but we were, um, like I said in that study, I think it was we were 700. So we were within 
uh, 100 vehicles at that time of meeting the 800, like you said, um, Councilman Leopard. Um, the issue that we had um, had when reviewing the uh, Sandusky and Hall was the, the volume on Hall Street was half uh, the amount of the 150. Um, in regards to Melmore and Circular, um, it uh, did not meet the 800, but the Circular Street volume did exceed the 150. So um, that one is that one is definitely the closest. Um, and I know in the email that I had sent to all the councilmen earlier in the week, um, of the four um, prior to moving forward with the study, um, when they were when I, I, we worked with the amongst as the traffic safety committee creating the four priority areas um, in which we were doing the studies, um, the one that caught my most attention prior prior to study was the Melmore and Circular. Um, because I knew that the volume coming into um, the intersection off of circular more than likely would exceed the 150. Um, didn't meet the 800, but um, that is a very busy intersection from both directions. Um, so uh, especially during the peak hours, um, which is triggered by school. Um, so that one is the one that I definitely um, if council um, moves forward with, regardless of a table or a pass, um, want to continue to monitor um, if, if you do give us that support, um, because that one is, you know, to me, the most concerning of potentially us backing up on. But I don't know that to the extent unless we give it a shot. Um, I've seen some things out there um, that could go one way or the other, um, but you're never going to know until... Um, you're looking at it on a daily basis. And like I said, the traffic volumes have changed and the patterns change every day. Um, so um, you give it a shot and then um, we, we'll back up if, if we feel needed. We're just trying to improve the traffic flow and, and keep both motorists and pedestrians safe. Councilman Perkins. Sorry, uh, my last question for you, Matt. Um, I know you've been sitting out there a while. Have you done, um, what's your calculation for the traffic? Has it, is it heavier than it was in October currently? So I didn't do, I looked at it from a different perception um, when okay. I was out there the last um, Friday and Monday, um, multiple times through the day. Um, what I did was I didn't necessarily count the volume. Um, I counted the gaps. Um, so when we were out there, okay. Um, I timed the amount of time it took a vehicle stopped on circular to cross through the intersection uh, with a stopwatch took five seconds. Um, and then what I did was I basically created this model um, in my mind, you know, you, you perceive you, you sit there, even though the signals operating, you're looking at the intersection as if it wasn't. So you're watching the Melmore Street traffic come into the intersection and you're like, okay, that car would continue to proceed forward but now there's these cars coming up to the intersection on circular and knowing that it takes five seconds for a car to cross that intersection. I basically sat there and counted one, two, three, four, five. Okay. That car on circular would have safely navigated that intersection. And yet there hadn't been a car enter the intersection from Melmore. So I strategically played out in my mind that analysis. Um, I think that, probably does more than, than counting the number. Uh, and I learned that over the last two days. Um, you might have more volume in a half hour period. Um, and then you might have dwindling effects on a 15 minute prior to that or a 15 minute after. And overall, it might average out on that one hour period, but you might have had a demand on that 30 minute period. So um, there are different fluctuations, but I just tried to, to create my own model in my head. And uh, like I said, it's, I think, um, you know, the only way to, to really visualize it is to give it a shot. Um, but um, I didn't count the volume as, as um, Councilman Perkins. I was just trying to see how traffic would flow. Um, Cause it seems like being near a school, sometimes you get larger rushes coming in and then next time you might have two minutes before you have a vehicle come so it definitely fluctuates okay thank you so i would like to i'm certainly extraordinarily appreciative of everyone's insight and for the discussion and the questions at this time though uh, i would like to 
ask our council clerk to call the roll for this vote. Councilman Perry. No. Councilwoman Boyle. Yes. Councilman Gillig. Yes. Councilwoman Yanatuno. Yes. Councilman Jones. Yes. Councilman Leopard. No. And Councilman Perkins. Yes. Ordinance 21-33 is approved by a vote of five to two. Ordinance number 21-34, introduced by Steve Leopard, ordinance approving the removal of a traffic signal and installation of stop signs at the intersection of North Sandusky and Hall Streets within the city. That is the third reading of ordinance 21-34. Councilman Leopard. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I would uh, ask for consideration of ordinance number 21-34. We have a motion for consideration of ordinance 21-34. Do we have a second? Councilwoman Yanatuno. A second, Mr. President. We have a motion and a second for council consideration of ordinance 21-34. And though I certainly don't want to limit anyone's ability uh, to ask questions or, or dialogue, um, I, I do want to I kind of want to see where we stand um, at this juncture. So if, if you have uh, questions or comments, would certainly love to hear them. Um, if not, we will get to the vote because there's been a lot of great discussion with this for sure. Councilman Jones. Oh, thank you, um, President Gilly. I have dialogue, I guess, and I told you at the second reading, I would repeat the same stuff I had here in the third reading. I'm willing to do that. Uh, Scott Horneman did an excellent job, better job than I can do tonight. But I just have to go on record. This is not a good ordinance to remove the stoplight at Hall and North Sandusky. So limit me to five minutes, but here we go. I heard another comment today. A lady called me from Franklin Street. I did not ask if I could share her name or address. She said that uh, people, uh, she adamant about removing the stoplight at Hall in North Sandusky. She went on to say that at the viaduct uh, the other day, I guess I wasn't aware of it, that's no big deal. She said eight cars came up Hudson Street to, and they went down Franklin Street going north. Eight cars went by her house. They were avoiding Hudson and North Sandusky Street. She said that they were going, and I don't know how she got her facts, but she said that eight vehicles were going up to Hall and North Sandusky so they could use that traffic light. She was adamant about not removing that. Item two, I got a phone call from a gentleman on Braden Court. Did not ask if I could use his name or address. He said he's lived on Braden Court for 20 years. It is not beneficial to the city of Tiffin to remove the traffic light at Hall and North Sandusky. He has grandkids. He says they cross over there during the summer months to go down the Shake Shack. He is not in favor of removing the traffic light at Hall and North Sandusky. I will go on to my A through E that uh, Clerk of Courts Forrest put in our men. A, leave the signal in as it is. Uh, I'm going back to Mr. Horneman's comments. You just don't complain about something you had to have a suggestion. My suggestion is A, leave it in. B, take the traffic light from Coe and Jefferson. It is operational and will not cost us twenty-five to $50,000. Bring it over to Holland North Sandusky Street. Install that, save us twenty-five dollars to $50,000. Put it on regular mode from 7A to 9 p.m. So this gentleman on Braden Court can get his kids to Shake Shack or Dare Al, whatever it is and then put it on flashing from 9 p.m. to 7 a.m. Option C, make Hall and North Sandusky Street a four-way stop. I have to admit that is not a good suggestion, but I'll put it in it. Item D, redo the study in 2022. I understood Engineer Watson say they were looking at 15 traffic signals in the city of Tiffin. 
All right, we did four. Then we're going to do another four. Then we're going to do another four. That leaves three. Add Hall and North Sandusky Street, and let's wait till 2023, 2025 to redo the study on Hall and North Sandusky Street and not remove it at this time. E, put a loop system in like at Sixes Corners. I come up East Davis, I come down West Davis, I sit there, I, I don't count 30, 32, 35, finally it recognizes my car is there, it changes the green and I can go. Uh, what else? Let's go to my little note here. Oh, yes. Uh, I went out today and did the square corner about four times. My Anne Marie said, Ken, what are you doing? I'm out there timing how long it takes me to cross Sandusky Street, how long it takes me to cross Hall Street to see if I can do it in six seconds or whatever some statistical number is. It took me 14 seconds to cross three lanes of North Sandusky Street. That would be on the south side because there's three lanes of traffic. It took me nine seconds, three times, to cross two lanes of traffic on North Sandusky Street on the north side. What those numbers had to do, I'm not sure, but I, but I just cannot sit here and listen to the rest of you and give it a shot. That sounds like a, my cousin Vinny. Oh, just give me a offer, give me a shot, let me try this. Uh, I don't know what I can say. Two weeks ago, I said 175 people said, leave it in. Three people said, I stand corrected. Yes, 175 said, leave it in. Three people, one is resident on North Sandusky Street. Two is from uh, Mr. Horniman's survey. Three people say, take it out. S add two more today. Now we're talking 177 people saying, leave it in. We have to listen to the people in the second ward and to give it a shot and table it and postpone it. If I cannot fight any harder than what I'm doing, shame on me for representing the people in the second ward. So I say, no, let's take the vote. As Mayor Mons would say, let's just take the vote. He said that twice before. Councilwoman Yanotuno. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I know I probably said some of this before, um, but I did live in that area for quite some time. And frankly, Hall Street Light always annoyed me living in that area. I hardly ever used Hall Street because it never failed. Every time I would take it to go to work, I'd get stuck beside somebody, behind somebody who had to go left and I'd have to wait through two lights. And so to this day, if I'm in that area, I always tend to head to Hudson. And when I do head to Hudson, I always notice every time I can finally go, traffic is jammed up because of that light on Sandusky. When you can finally go from the bridge side, the other side's jammed up and you can't go. So those are my observations of having been around that intersection for quite a few years. And so that's why I don't support the light being there. There was another comment I was going to make, but I can't remember what it was at this <laughs> this moment. But that's why I support that one coming down. I agree with voting on it tonight. I think I know Ken Jones doesn't think we should give it a chance, um, but I think giving it a chance gives people the opportunity to see how it will operate, and if there's a problem, we can remove it. Thank you. Thank you, both the Councilman Jones and Councilwoman Yanatuno. Councilwoman Boyle. Thank you. Just a quick comment in response to Councilman Jones's uh, comments of giving it a shot. To be clear, my my opinion and vote of test, this testing phase is not based off of a whim that I came up with. It's, it's based off of data that was provided by professionals and our city engineers. So um, the testing phase, as I see it from my perspective, is an opportunity to test out the professional um, performance that was uh, done by um, by our city professionals and uh, the opportunity that we have then in that time frame is to be able to pull that back and, and revert back to the, the original infrastructure at that point. So I just want to be clear that um, if I'm voting yes for this, it's not giving it a shot based off of uh, my own opinion. 
Councilman Leopard. Uh, my observations of traffic on uh, Sandusky and Hall, commercial traffic between seven and three is unbelievable. There's probably as many semis as there are cars or trucks hauling boat trailers or trailers behind the trucks uh, for other types of business. Uh, <laughs> I, I cannot imagine what crossing crossing Sandusky Street on Hudson would be like without that traffic light. At least with that traffic light, you're getting a break. Otherwise, if you're going to cross Sandusky on Hudson, you got four lanes of traffic, and you got to really be watching because you got a bridge right there with a, a short runway. And now. <clears throat> I think you're going to be without a traffic light for three eighths to a half of a mile. You're going to go from Sixes Corners to Miami Street before you have a light. I see that my my opinion is traffic's going to move a little bit faster, and you're going to be more consistent traffic at uh, Sandusky and Hudson. And uh, I think I think the problem area is going to be Sandusky and Hudson more than it is going to be Hall and Sandusky. I really do. Councilman Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. I told several people tonight was going to be a short meeting. The mayor is not going to be here. He's not going to do his half hour dissertation. I guess I was wrong on that end. I appeal to the other six city council people. Maybe you didn't get down to city council and look in your mailboxes, but none of the six of you, unless you didn't go down to city hall and get your mail, got petitions, signatures from 142 people in the second ward that said, leave the traffic light in. If you got down to city hall and looked in your mailbox, I put 17 signatures from Faith Church saying, leave the traffic light in. You have to trust me on this, and I know some of you may not trust me, but at least 10 people have told me since that time, leave the traffic light in. Only three people, and I'll repeat this till 10 o'clock if you want to hear it. One person on North Sandusky Street, I don't want to use his name, said, taken out. Two people from Scott Horniman's petition study said, taken out. When there's 177 people say, leave it in, and three taken out, I cannot believe the six of you are sitting back there. Well, what should I, what was that word Leopard used? Uh, consideration, yeah, let me consider how I'm gonna vote. I'll stand down. <clears throat> well, Council Minionatuno. Thank you, Mr. President. The same situation happened with West Perry Street and as I said the other night, as a school board member, I went to city council and spoke against taking out the light on West Perry Street. And that involved the Washington building with little kids walking to school. And I was very much against it as, long, as well as other school people. And we were proven wrong. That light is actually out of there has made it safer. And the other comment I wanted to bring up was city engineer Watson brought up the same thing I noticed in the letters we've been receiving from people. They keep saying that they keep seeing people running the light, speeding up to beat the light. To me, that's why we're saying it's dangerous. It's because people are trying to beat the lights and they're speeding up, which makes it more dangerous. And as far as Hudson getting worse, like I said, I live there. Hudson was about the only way you couldn't get through is if the light was backed up on hall. And I gave the example from a few years ago when I was leaving work because Frost Parkway was blocked for one of the festivals. And I pulled out and a Decker's vehicle because I used to work for them part-time or on subcontract. And so I noticed the Decker vehicle was stuck on Hudson. And I'm like, wow, I'm never gonna get through. So I worked my way over to hall because you would finally get through. And that poor Decker's truck, by the time I still made myself through several light changes, the Decker truck was still stuck on Hudson because it couldn't get through because of the light at Hall. And so there, there's different ways to look at this stuff. 
thank you. Thank you. And if I may, Councilman Jones, as combative as you might be, I would just like to say I have looked at your petition and it did not have any information as to the safety steps that would be implemented, the 150 day process, the monthly meetings of the traffic safety committee. The question was asked, do you want a light removed at Hall and North Sandusky? And it was certainly missing a lot of information. And as a 15 year educator, that's how you're able to make informed decisions is by having all of the information and simply asking a question, do we want this light or not, does not cover the entire story, in my opinion. Councilman Perry. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. That's an actually an excellent point. Um, I, um, um, when I, I'm old enough to remember uh, uh, 53 and Hus Street having a light when I was a kid. And uh, obviously that light has been taken down um, at some point. And I never seem to, to think there's ever an issue uh, with traffic when you're on Hus trying to get on or off or uh, turn right or left onto to 53. Um, I, um, and, and so from a, from a vehicle standpoint, I know, you know, it might be a little busier down by Hall. Um, because, you know, at Sixes Corner, it might disperse a little bit, but majority of that, that traffic is, is continuing on to 53. Um, so from a vehicle standpoint, I, I don't see an issue. Uh, where I do see an issue is, is somebody trying to cross um, a pedestrian, uh, trying to get across four lanes, uh, does seem dangerous to me. Um, and, and to vote yes for this would to be not listening to all the people that have to live right next to it. I know, uh, you said that um, it is missing a lot of context, and I, I certainly agree. Um, and I would love to see a, a more accurate uh, traffic study, especially for this one, um, maybe next year or the year following. Um, so that, that those would be my uh, thoughts on, on this particular one. Thank you, Councilman Perry. Uh, final comment from Councilman Leopard. Hi, thank you. I'll try to keep this short. Uh, we're talking about safety in school kids. I remember when we had two crossing guards at Sixes Corners. I remember when we had a crossing guard at Hall Street. I remember when we had a crossing guard at Miami Street and a crossing guard at Clay Street. Those are all gone. If a school, if a parent tells a, one of their school-aged children to cross the street at a uh, at a traffic light. They're going to be walking three eighths to a half a mile to get from the Sixes Corners to, to Miami Street. Much too far. Uh, you know, we're going to, if we're going to talk about school kids and safety, I think we need to talk about keeping the traffic signal at Hall Street. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Leopard. And uh, we're currently studying the Civil War and as uh, President Lincoln said, though passions may be inflamed. Um, you know, I just very much appreciate all of the all of the thought and all the consideration and all the discussion with regards to this. It just it, it shows the amount of care that you good folks have for the city. But with that in mind, I'd like to call for the vote. You're muted. Councilman Perry. No. Councilwoman Boyle. Yes. Councilman Gillig. Yes. Councilwoman Yanatuno. Yes. Councilman Jones. Uh, point of order, can I vote no twice? That's a question. No. Then no. Councilman Leopard. No. Councilman Perkins. No. Ordinance 21-34 is defeated by a vote of four to three. Ordinance number 21-35 introduced by Steve Leopard. Ordinance approving the removal of a traffic signal and installation of stop signs at the intersection of Coe and Jefferson Streets within the city. 
That is the third reading of Ordinance 21-35. Councilman Leppard. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I would ask for passage of Ordinance number 21-35. We have a motion for passage of Ordinance 21-35. Do we have a second? Councilman Perry. Yeah, I'll second, Mr. President. Thank you. We have a motion and a second for passage of Ordinance 21-35. Do we have any discussion? Councilman Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I have considered voting on this Ordinance 2135 involving the traffic light at <coughs> Jefferson. And I said two weeks ago, and I'll say it a hundred more times, is it good for the second ward? It really doesn't affect the second ward. Is it good for the city of Tiffin? Since no one has contacted me, knocked on my door, mail, email, voicemail, phone call, they either don't know what's going on or don't care. So with that, I have to defer back to DGL professionals and go with that. So that's my input. Thank you, Councilman Jones. Any additional questions or comments? Discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to take the roll on ordinance 21-35, please. Councilman Perry. Yes. Councilwoman Boyle. Yes. Councilman Gillig. Yes. Councilwoman Yanatuno. Yes. Councilman Jones? Yes. Councilman Leopard? Yes. Councilman Perkins? Yes. Ordinance 21-35 is approved by a vote of seven to zero. Uh, Councilwoman Boyle, may I ask um, for Ordinance 21-36 if you would consider um, asking for action on that? Sure, yeah. Um, I'd like, oh, yes. Yep. Oh, we'll get... yeah. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. Yep. Ordinance number 21-36, introduced by Ben Gillig, an ordinance providing for the issuance and sale of $3,155,000 of notes in anticipation of the issuance of bonds for the purpose of improving Progress Parkway and Fair Lane between certain termini, termini and adjacent city property by grading, drading, curbing, paving, constructing sidewalks, curb ramps, sanitary sewers, water lines and storm sewers, and storm water detention basins, and installing and improving catch basins, fire hydrants, manholes, street lighting and traffic signs, signals and signalization where necessary, in each case together with the necessary appurtenances and work incidental thereto, including certain related and required improvements to US Route 224, County Roads 1 and 54 and Township Road 18 and acquiring real estate and interest in real estate in connection therewith and declaring an emergency. That is the third reading of ordinance 21-36. Councilwoman Boyle. Thank you. I would like to ask for council's passage of ordinance 21-36. We have a motion for passage of ordinance 21-36. Do we have a second? Councilman Perkins. I'd like to second the motion, please. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to pass ordinance 21-36. Is there any discussion? Very good. I'll ask the council clerk to take a vote on the emergency, please. Councilman Perry. Yes. Boyle? Yes. Gillig? Yes. Yan Juno? Yes. Jones? Yes. Leopard? Yes. And Perkins? Yes. The emergency passes by a vote of seven to zero. Uh, Council Clerk will take a vote on the passage, please. Um, Councilman Perry? Yes. Boyle? Yes. Gillig? Yes. Yan Juno? Yes. Jones? Yes. Leopard? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Ordinance 21-36 is approved by a vote of seven to zero. Ordinance number 21-41 introduced by Steve Leopard. Ordinance authorizing the mayor to accept a permanent easement from TMP 447 LLC and or Tiffin Metal Investments LLC or current property owner on or near 401 and 447 Wall Street for storm sewer purposes and declaring an emergency. That is the second reading of ordinance 21-41. Ordinance number 21-43 introduced by Steve Leopard. Ordinance authorizing and directing the mayor to sign an LPA federal local let project agreement with the Ohio Department of Transportation 
for the Ella Street Bridge Replacement Project and declaring an emergency. That is the first reading of Ordinance 21-43. Councilman Leppard. Uh, thank you. I had um, asked for the suspension of City Council's free reading rule and passage of Ordinance 21-43. We have a motion for suspension of our three reading rule and immediate passage of ordinance 21-43. Do we have a second? Councilman Perkins. I'd like to second, please. We have a motion and a second to suspend the three reading rule and immediately pass ordinance 21-43. Is there any discussion? Councilman Jones. Thank you, Mr. Gilly, or President Gilly. I am considering voting on this ordinance 2143, but before I do that, I need to know what LTA is. I'm not gonna vote on something to pass if I don't know what LTA is. So could someone explain that to me in layman's terms? Do you mean LPA by any chance? Uh, what did I say? All right, whatever, whatever that acronym is, yes, explain that. Uh, Law Director Howard. Yeah, it's a local public agency. It's a certain type of project that ODOT administers and uh, they, they're dealing with a, a local public agency in administering the, the, uh, the project uh, that they're funding through a grant. And so it's a standard agreement. We've uh, done multiple of these over the years as we are recipients of ODOT grants that are, well, it starts out with federal money, federal highway administration money. Okay, thank you for that explanation. Someday maybe uh, Law Director Howard will start a podcast. You know, Law Director explains acronyms. <laughs> uh, he'd be rocking up the iTunes charts. Well, well, that'd be after I get it correctly. LTA, LTA, <laughs> whatever. Well said. Uh, Councilman Leppard. Uh, this is a two million dollar, uh, two million dollar grant for the bridge, and city really needs to keep this project moving. I know it's a year away, but the last thing we want to do is uh, uh, to put a hold on any old dot decision. Very well said. Any further questions or discussion? And then I'll ask Council Clerk to take a vote on the suspension. Councilman Perry. Yes. Boyle. Yes. Gilly. Yes. Yanatuno. Yes. Jones. Yes. Leopard. Yes. Perkins. Yes. Suspension passes by a vote of seven to zero. Can we take a vote on the emergency, please? Councilman Perry. Yes. Boyle. Yes. Gilly. Yes. Yanatuno. Yes. Jones? Yes. Leopard? Yes. And Perkins? Yes. The emergency passes by a vote of seven to zero. Let's take a vote on the passage. Councilman Perry? Yes. Boyle? Yes. Gillig? Yes. Yanatuno? Yes. Jones? Yes. Leopard? Yes. And Perkins? Yes. Ordinance 21-43 passes by a vote of seven to zero. Ordinance number 21-44 introduced by Steve Leppard. Ordinance amending the 2021 budget ordinance number 21-11 to appropriate $96,968 into the sewer maintenance budget for emergency sewer repairs. That is the first reading of ordinance 21-44. And if I may, I'd like to ask the finance director, is there no cause for suspension on this matter? No, there is not. We can, we do not need to pass it tonight. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. That concludes the ordinances, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Clerk Forrest. Does anyone have any other business to come before the council this evening? Uh, Mayor Fote. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that our next meeting is going to be at, uh, we're going to be back in our council chambers and um, that'll be uh, June 7th. Also that week, uh, June 10th, we also have a tour of the uh, Water Pollution Control Center at 10 o'clock. Just a reminder. Thank you.
Thank you, Mayor Fote. Uh, Nick Dutro. I, I just wanted to say that I have already spoken with the mayor. I will be putting together some kind of release or uh, a memo to the public to let them know that the next meeting will be in person. Thank you, Mr. Dutro. And just for clarification purposes, um, with regards to the vote, um, it would appear as though we will not move forward with any process of, um, of blinking lights and bagging or, or anything else with regards to North Sandusky and Hall. Is that accurate? Yes, that is accurate. Very good. Very good. Just wanted to make sure that was very clear. Um, Councilman Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I would like to schedule a materials and equipment meeting, um, but I have to defer to Mr. Gillig and Mr. Perkins, Councilman Gillig and Perkins, see when they're available to discuss the possibility of transferring two city police vehicles to the Sheriff's Department for mutual use. So I'll just ask about your two schedules and combine it with myself and go from there. Thank you, Councilman Jones. Uh, Councilman Perkins, Wednesday and Thursday are your best days, correct? Yeah, um, you uh, you can go ahead and list the time on those days and I'll be there. Okay. Uh, Councilman Jones, um, if we are looking at next week, that's my final week of school. So anytime after three, I'd be more than happy to attend on Wednesday or Thursday. Okay, you're talking the 26th and 27th? Uh, yes, yes, sir. And Councilman Leppard? Uh, thank you. I'd like to ask the law director, uh, is this something we could handle tonight with a boat so the sheriff's department can get those cruisers a little bit quicker? The, uh, your action would need to be taken by, um, ordinance. And so you do not have an ordinance in front of you. So, um, um, I think the earliest you could act on it would be at your next council meeting, unless you wanted to have a special council meeting um, and um, for that purpose. Um, those are your choices. Well, uh, I'll, pass it, I'll pass that question on to uh, uh, Mayor Float, and uh, I see uh, Lieutenant Windsor still with us. Uh, in talking with, um, in talking with, um, uh, Chief Windsor, if we got it done by the next uh, council meeting, uh, that's going to that'll be acceptable timing. Yeah. So we I'll, can we can get it done then. So to answer uh, Councilman Gillig's question, I have a I want to sit in on the charter review at six p.m. on Wednesday the twenty sixth, and Thursday twenty seventh is good for me all day. So Councilman Perkins, what's your wishes? Um, let's just do like a 3.30 or 4, whatever Ben's available on that Thursday. 3.30 uh, would be ideal on Thursday. Perfect. And it's going to be quick, so. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. Right. May I ask, uh, <laughs> if Chief Windsor's with us, will that, will that work for oh, his good schedule? Point. Good point. I will contact him myself and uh, let him know what we've uh, decided. And Kind of go from there. Or Nick could bring him in. If, if he's there, yeah, that'd be great. Oh, he's we still with us. Pretty much having a meeting right now. <laughs> <laughs> but we have to right, right about the public, public, I believe. So, yeah. can can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh yes. Oh yes. Uh, Chief Windsor is Thursday. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. Is yes. Thursday... I don't know if I... Okay. Yeah, I will make any meeting work. And I know I've already spoken with Sheriff Stevens. And if you'd like to hear from him also, he would uh, he make his schedule available as well. Okay. We're talking Thursday, the 27th of this month, 3.30 via Zoom. I, I will be available. Thank you, sir. Thank and you. I ask uh, whoever it is, Mr. Dutro or City Administrator, to set this Zoom meeting up for us. And the purpose is? Oh, I stand corrected. Purpose is, and I 
stated earlier, but I'll say it again, to um, recommend transferring two Tiffin City police cruisers to the Sheriff's Department and any other business that comes before the committee. Thank you, Councilman Jones. Um, any other additional comments or anything good for the order? Uh, City Administrator Thornton. Just for Councilman Jones, I will set up that uh, Zoom meeting for you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And if, and if I may uh, just very briefly uh, call on the expertise of uh, some longtime members of the committee, what sort of products did we make at the General Electric um, on Wall Street? Hermetic motors. Thank you, sir. I was going to say the same, hermetic. My uh, father, William Jones, better known as Casey Jones, he passed away in 73, but he was a long time uh, electrical engineer at General Electric, retired at age 65. They called him back at age 66 and the electricians couldn't even figure out his madness. And I guess he would take a lock nut and twist, tie two things together and not label them. And he had to undo them and tell them what it was. And my Anne Marie worked there in 1973 when I met her and she worked in the winding department. So yes, I got some background there. So would the motors then go into various appliances? Right. They were all, you know, small motors. Yeah, I've got to do some more research on that. That's the yeah. summer's coming up. I got I got some projects lined Meet up. Meet them by the thousands. Yeah. Well, well, don't do too much research because in 1969, three of us transferred from, or no, we were working, you could get a job from factory to factory. Three of us went to GE, turned in our applications. The other two gentlemen got hired. I didn't. I followed up with the HR person at General Electric. He said my dad came in the office ripped up my application, did not want me working at General Electric. I told the HR person, he cannot do that, filled out a second application, went home, complained to my dad, and I never did get hired. So I got fired before I got hired, but let's not share that with anyone. I'll be darned. All right. <laughs> Any further comments? Mr. Dutro. I know it's not typical to have somebody like me comment <laughs> during a council meeting, but I will add that uh, for anyone who had walked through that building uh, in the recent number of years, you, you'd be shocked to see what all TPC has done there. Um, they're, they're really doing a lot of great work um, and, and bringing that place back up. Um, I think a lot of people who had worked at GE would be really excited to see um, some of the things that are being done there. So um, renovations are looking beautiful. I uh, did a walk through there with uh, Tom Mayberger recently, and, and they're doing a, a really great job at getting that place cleaned up. I apologize for uh, asking another question on this, but did there used to be reunion lunches for General Electric workers? I used to see those posted at the post office. I wonder if I can try to contact some of those folks one of these days, but that's more rhetorical than anything. Anybody else for the good of the order? Councilman Jones. Well, I'm not sure if it's for, for the good of the order or not, but uh, one of the council members made reference to myself about being combative tonight. And if you think I was combative tonight to support the people of the second ward, you haven't seen anything yet for the next two and a half years or the next six and a half years, unless Scott Horneman runs against me in 2024. But if it means being called combative to stick up for the people in the second ward, Call me Mr. Combative. So I just didn't want to leave without letting you know what's the future it's going to hold. No, no one's questioning your commitment to the second ward. I'm questioning the way in which you delivered it. But that notwithstanding, I believe we will call the meeting adjourned at 9.29 p.m. I'd like to thank everyone for their time tonight and wish you a wonderful rest of the week. <laughs>